Number 10. Lifelong soldiers. From the time they were born to the day they died, men were forbidden in Spartan society to be anything but a soldier. They had to live and breathe battle. How, how the heck did they do anything else? How'd they get their food, do their taxes, live beyond that? Well, most of the time it was the women who did it and as well as their slaves, which we will talk about more later. So if men wanted to weave baskets or be an artist, I want to be an actor dad, be an accountant or literally do anything else, no go. It was forbidden by law to be anything else besides a bloodthirsty, spear wielding, rippling abbed hero of the Spartans. Unless you were an old dude, it stopped around when you were 60. Then you could run the politics and make all the decisions in a three stage process. Now some men would probably dig that, but everyone's built differently and you would be ridiculed if you weren't, I don't know, awesome at your job. Number 9. Diet and Exercise Living among the Spartans was essentially like living on a diet and exercise retreat in California with all the hippie moms who were like, it's okay, I can just eat an almond and then feel great. And you could never leave. In order to prepare soldiers for the scarcity of war, they doled out rations that were always just like slightly not enough, just slightly insufficient and very bland. I mean, psychologically, if you are building machines for war, probably a smart idea not to make them used to indulgence and make them resourceful. But they were raised with a specific kind of hatred for anyone who did not maintain their physique and diet. If you didn't maintain yourself at peak physical fitness, then you ran the risk of public ridicule and even being banished from the city state. But they did drink wine, however they were very strict against inebriation and would even get their servants drunk to show the dangers of it. Number 8. Hazing and Fighting Today, we know bullying is bad. I hate it. You hate it. Kids are so mean. Like so mean. And it seems to be an everlasting battle trying to teach people not to be to each other. I don't know, it's just really hard man. Why can't we just all be nice and get along? But in the Spartan world, hazing and fighting was encouraged. It all goes back to being ready for war mentality. Grown soldiers would often stir up strife and conflict between children in order to toughen them up. Those who showed signs of cowardice, timidity, weakness in general, they would be punished severely. After all, there is no room for retreat in front of the enemy. So literally while you're getting bullied by your peers, your teacher comes over and joins in. Number 7. Marriage 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 is what brings us together today, especially if you are 30. On top of training as a warrior your whole life, Spartan men were forced to be married by the age of 30. If they got married before then, they'd still have to live separately from their wives in an all-male commune. So if they wanted to see their bride, they had to like have their mates cover for them and sneak out at night. But it was considered a failure as a Spartan man to not produce heirs, especially sons, back into the population. Now women usually got married at the same time as men, about 1819, which was typically older than other civilizations. But they weren't forced into it. Both men and women had to be equal to each other and approve of their physical health and fitness of their partners. Spartans saw marriage as a means of making more Spartans, so if it ended up you couldn't do it, you had to find a partner who could. In some cases, both men and women would have multiple partners with multiple children who would belong to all. This is where it gets weird. The night before the marriage, the women had to dress up as men, have their heads shaved, and they were left in a dark room until their man, like their suitor, came into the room and kidnapped them. Number six, Mycenaean helots. So, I previously mentioned that men were banned from having another job besides being a warrior. Though they were educated, they couldn't do anything else besides train. How did anyone get anything done? Well, the women were educated and free most of the time and completed a lot of the work, but the main source of work came from the Mycenaean helots, aka their slaves. The Spartans invaded and conquered their next door neighbors, subjugated them, and made them slaves. They were like, we're gonna go train all day. Uh, ladies, we're gonna do other things. Uh, you guys are gonna cook, clean, do everything else um, while we live our lives. Right. This was totally unique to the Spartans as opposed to anyone else in Greece. Their neighbors were called Helots and they lived in Messina. They became the engine of Sparta for free, sadly, and they weren't treated very nicely. Though sometimes they were partied with, I don't understand. It wasn't a good time. As you can guess, slavery equals bad. At number five, demand. 
In ancient Rome, there was an incredibly high demand for slaves, but since there were so many slaves in Rome, there was always work for them. Oftentimes, people sold themselves or their children into slavery in order to pay off their debts, so when it came to being bought, that came pretty easy. Other than public office, slaves were used for almost every activity in ancient Rome. The most common slave trade was mining because workers were always in demand, mostly due to the high level of danger that came with the job and the fact that many slaves were injured or died while working in the mines, and slave masters needed to keep replacing those who could no longer work. Domestic labor and farming were also high demand jobs for slaves back then. Back then, the logic behind using slave labor for these types of jobs was that, quote, free labor should be used in unhealthy places. End quote. Basically, they believed that it was better to have a slave pass away on the job than a free person because it would impact their business less. At number 4, Procurement The way that slaves were acquired in ancient Rome was pretty messed up, I will say. Typically, slaves were acquired through four different ways. They would be brought in as war captives, as victims of pirate raids, by trade, or by breeding. During the early expansion of the Roman Empire, many war captives were turned into slaves. The pirates from Sicilia, located in what is now modern-day Turkey, did business with the Romans and supplied them with a lot of their slaves. The pirates would bring their slaves to the island of Delos, which back then was considered considered to be the international center of slave trading. The slave trade was such a big deal back then that it has been recorded that on at least one occasion, 10,000 people were traded as slaves and shipped back to Italy in one day. This was a big business opportunity for a lot of people, but of course, no one ever considered the lives of the people they were buying and selling. At number three, fugitives. As you can imagine, life as a slave in ancient Rome or at any period of time wasn't easy. Living conditions were poor, it was dangerous, and no one should ever be treated like that or used for free labor. Many slaves have been known to escape and obviously the same went for those in ancient Rome. Slaves running away from their masters was a common thing back then, and to deal with it, slave owners would hire professional slave catchers to hunt down, capture, and return the escaped slave back to their owner. For slave owners who wanted to take matters into their own hands, they would advertise rewards for those who could return their slaves, or they would just try and locate their slave themselves. Some slave owners had ways of preventing their slaves from getting away, like using collars with instructions on where to return the escaped slave, much like a dog collar, which is just dehumanizing. At number two, revolts. In Roman times, slave revolts were pretty common. There have been a number of recorded slave revolts in Roman history. I mentioned the one that was led by Spartacus, but there's another pretty famous Roman slave revolt that was led by a man named Eunice. Eunice led a revolt that happened in Sicily from 135 to 132 BCE. It is said that Eunice believed himself to be a prophet and claimed to have several mystical visions. Eunice was able to persuade a number of other slaves to follow him when he performed a trick where sparks and flames came out of his mouth. They believed that he was magical and so they followed him to try and fight back against the Roman forces. Unfortunately, they were defeated, but the example that they set is believed to have inspired yet another slave revolt in Sicily later in 104 to 103. BCE. And finally, at number one, totally normal. Probably the most messed up thing about life as a Roman slave was just how normal slavery was in society. I mean, the Roman people were so invested in their slaves that they continuously tried to crush their revolts and they tried everything in their power to keep them from escaping. Even the sheer number of slaves that were in their society just shows how important slavery was to them. Back then, slavery was just an unquestioned institution. For many, it was just a normal part of life, which is actually quite frightening when you think about it. There is no recorded history of Romans ever questioning slavery in their society, and all economic, legal, and social forces in Rome at this time worked hard to try and preserve slavery as part of their society. To the ancient Romans, slaves were seen as the direct opposite of free people, which they believed was a necessary balance that they needed in their society. They never completely got rid of slavery either. Though they did try and create new rules and laws to make life as a slave more bearable, they were still bought and sold into servitude and were seen as property and lesser people. Number 10, Elizabeth I. Good old Queen Bess is one of the most remembered queens in the British monarchy, male or female. She's a pretty big deal. Elizabeth loved to make her fellow male nobles fall under her spell. She was witty, cunning, and very well liked by her court. However, one of the things that earned her some enemies was establishing a Protestant England. Her sister Mary, her predecessor, fought very hard for the opposite. She was very Catholic, and we will get to how bloody that was later. But Queen Bess 
pissed a lot of people off, especially Spain. She was supposed to marry the Catholic Spanish king after her sister passed, but uh, she turned him down. This led to a conflict between Protestant England and Catholic Spain, but her navy defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588. Mary, Queen of Scots, laid claim to the English throne and was one of Lizzie's greatest internal threats. Mary was a Catholic, which made all the Catholics of England back her. Mary was also presumed to be behind several assassination attempts against the Queen. Finally, Queen Elizabeth had to take action, and after keeping her cousin hostage for 20 years, she finally had to have her executed. We'll talk more about her later. Number nine, Catherine the Great. So Catherine the Great was called the Great for a reason. She was a pretty epic woman by most accounts. She even had one of the first vaccines, which is pretty crazy. Though she wasn't actually born in Russia or even Russian at all, Catherine was not content to go down in history quietly. She considered herself an enlightened ruler, and history tends to agree with aims of prioritizing education for the people. She had many lovers, and there is enough evidence to suggest that the son she had was illegitimate. Peter III of Russia was hardly the man Catherine intended on marrying, and later planned a coup against him which resulted in her position of power. However, the coup did turn bloody when on July 17th, Peter died under mysterious circumstances. There isn't proof that she was directly involved or even knew about it, but it cast a dark shadow over her reign for the rest of the time. Number eight, Grace O'Malley. We've got enough traditional royalty on this list that we definitely need to spice it up. Enter Grace O'Malley, the pirate queen of Ireland. Pirate queen, what a title. Definitely considered unholy behavior, Grace abandoned the traditions of women of the time and fled to the sea. There, she took on the waves and perils of Davy Jones' locker with a legendary frog. She was born into the clan O'Malley around 1530, around the time of Henry VIII's rule over England and Ireland. Clan O'Malley was a notorious seafaring clan and ruled the southern shore of Clue Bay, Aquiland, and most of the barony of Murrisk for over 300 years. Grace was really well educated and could even converse fully in Latin, Spanish, Scottish, Gaelic, and French. She was not one to be refused, and after spending years fighting the British, she finally met Queen Bess. And not only did she speak Latin to her, but she refused refused to bow as she was considered a queen herself by that point. Number seven, Mary Queen of Scots. I told you I was gonna bring her up. A name you will recognize as I've already mentioned her before, but in terms of who the villain in that story is, it depends on which side you're telling the story on. Mary's story is full of tragedy, romance, betrayal, loss, and heartbreak. Unlike Lizzie, Mary was a dedicated Catholic and spent the entirety of her reign trying to gather the Catholics against Elizabeth. She had a series of marriages and relationships that led to tragedy every which way she went. Her first husband, the Dauphin of France, died shortly after their marriage. Her second husband, she loved until he became a drunkard, and then she just started running things. But he was mysteriously unalive while she was six months pregnant. He was inside a building that exploded, but his body landed outside and it turned out he was strangled. So what happened there? She would later give birth to two stillborn sons, but she would have sons later on. She would have a son who would inherit the throne after Elizabeth's death, but it was due to Mary's plotting and scheming that eventually ended her in death, so she did actually plot to kill Elizabeth. So that's a pretty unholy deed, I would say. Number six, Princess Olga of Kiev. Okay, wow, this woman. One saint you definitely don't want to mess with. Despite being a saint, Princess Olga of Kiev was actually pretty sinful. She was one of the most vicious and vengeful rulers in the history of Kievan Rus, which would later become Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Olga took center stage after her husband died and made sure she would never be forgotten. Her husband died in a very gruesome way by the enemies that we're gonna talk about in a second. When the people who viciously unalived her husband tried to persuade her to marry their leader, they sent 20 men. Olga told them to wait in their boats, had her men dig a ditch in the meantime, and the next morning buried the men alive. She then lied and told the king she would accept his offer if he sent his best company to retrieve her. He didn't know about all that stuff yet. When they got there, she locked them in a bathhouse and torched it. But it didn't stop there. Olga didn't stop there, that's not her style. She would later host a steak dinner with her enemies in which they were staked. Very Vlad the Impaler, I know. Then she set whole villages on fire by attaching sulfur to pigeons and then it was just crazy. Damn, like hell has no fury like a woman scorned, let me tell you. Number five, rat catcher. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in and around a castle. It's an important role, of course, like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet, which I'll get into later, but there needs to be a chasseur de rats. 
Chasseur de rats. I'm just gonna start calling myself that. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease. They didn't have city buses or, you know, people walking around throwing bottles. And with these castles being big and dark, they were probably full of rats. Black rats were a common household problem, yuck. So in comes the well respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try and use spells to get rid of rats. Wouldn't work really too well, but more often than not, that didn't work, so poison powders were the main trick of the trade. The most famous you probably heard of is the Pied Piper. He visited Germany, he arrived in the small town, and rumor has it this guy used a flute to drive all the rats just into the river. He just, hmm. He does a musical performance and then exterminates all of your pests. If anything, he should be getting a bonus. But rather, the town insists they weren't even gonna pay him. So he used his flute to make everybody just go away and leave the town forever. What an OG. He's like, you don't wanna pay me? No sweat. <gasps> Number four, the Crusades. Just imagine this. Thick, heavy metal armor reflecting the heat from the sun back against you as you chug along the desert. Despite being in the holy land, this certainly sounds like hell. As I mentioned earlier, men were expected to go to war when called, even if they had no training or skill and like maybe knew how to use a toothpick but had no idea what a sword was. For many, it was a death sentence and the first crusades were particularly brutal um, because you weren't only being called to war because of, you know, honor, but you were being called to war because it was a religious thing. Getting there was awful in the first place, you might not even make the voyage. Then marches through the desert were long and hot with soldiers constantly at odds with starvation, dehydration, disease, infection, the elements, and then of course, a spontaneous attack from the enemy. So like you're exhausted and all of a sudden you have to be like, huh, fighting somebody to save your life. There are even stories of some of them boiling shoe leather to eat it because they had nothing else. And after what we know of tanning, ugh, many crusaders justified their suffering as a part of the spiritual journey. So if you did fall ill to disease, you were just kind of left by the side of the road to die alone. Number three, groom of the stool. Nowadays, assistants grab your coffee for you, maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off doing your other business stuff. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool was quite vital when it came to the king. Created by King Henry VIII, the role was to assist the king's bowel movements. Yeah, you had just a box with you that you carried at all times, little opening lid, smelled horrible, and you would literally follow the king until he needed to use you. Yeah, porta potties weren't a thing, and there's no way you're going to catch a king shitting in the woods. In fact, you won't even catch a king wiping his own behind. That was also reserved for the groom of the stool. Lucky you. In this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl, the whole setup. And you're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? What must you have done to deserve such a punishment? Well, this is the job you wanted, really. Only sons of noblemen could take on this role, and in doing so, they also gain access to every room, tons of nice clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, and of course, a high pay, yeah. I would say this is the craziest job on this list, but it's really not. Number two, the executioner. A man named Franz Schmidt meticulously chronicled his life as an executioner in detail. And well, as you can guess, it's not it's not a fun one, but there was a lot of humanity behind it too. He had to start practicing on pumpkins at first, then graduate to live animals, and then humans. Who would choose a role like this? Well, though legally the role wasn't hereditary, it pretty much was by expectation and blood. The job was passed from eldest son to eldest son with other sons being trained to fill vacancies. Daughters of executioners married sons of executioners, so the position would continue. As most people saw this as a pretty undesirable profession, it was difficult to keep anyone at their post, so the job fell to the men who inherited the axe, as it were. So, not legally, but it was. This cycle of executioners created something called executioner dynasties across Europe. The existence of these dynasties meant that men were trapped in this cycle of employment and had few other opportunities to work. It also meant you had a very lonely life, as people who associated with death weren't people anyone liked to hang around. And number one, the gong farmer. The gong farmer, of course we had to end on this one as it's definitely the most crappy of the list. Medieval washrooms are just horrible. They're not really a thing. They didn't have the sanitation techniques that we have today. Stuff would often 
pile up within the castle walls and over time it would smell worse and worse. You can only imagine. The rat trapper would be around this area too, I'm assuming. So maybe they would see each other and fist bump and be like, hey, our jobs suck, nice, let's do it, get that bread. So these respected gong farmers, they would come in and take the bad stuff away from the castle. They were crap commuters, essentially. These cesspits were usually in the bottom of the castle, the lowest level, because you know how gravity and things work. These guys would go in and dig through years of yuck piles of it just moving all day long back and forth out of the castle. They too were paid well, really well obviously, but a lot of these gong farmers got sick. A good number of them just wouldn't come out of those pits. Pretty horrible, right? And on top of that, people didn't like talking to them. Their job wasn't cool like the guy who takes heads. Head and shoulders also didn't exist back then. They didn't smell the best. They were often just kind of eh, and they crossed the street. It was sad. It was all bad. Hashtag all bad. Number 10, parties of poison. Hindsight is 2020, which I find more ironic than ever since the whole thing that happened and is continuing to happen. Today we know that lead, especially in large doses, is not good. It's poison. But a lot of the pipes that the Romans used in their plumbing were made from lead. Their water had 100 times more lead in it than the water that came from the springs, which means every time they drank water, they were poisoning themselves. Some side effects include behavioral changes as well as weakening organs and vital signs, etc., which may explain some of the more questionable emperor behaviors or the fall of the Roman Empire because people got nuts. But to add insult to injury, the Romans used to sweeten their wine with something called sapa. Sapa is lead acetate, the sugar of lead, which is, and it's also a salt, which is confusing, and therefore poison. Since Romans could down as much as two liters of wine in one sitting, they were slowly poisoning themselves, first with water, then with the wine. Speaking of wine, moving on to number nine, we have you better love wine. If you're a vodka or a beer person, you might not fit in while partying with the Romans, especially if you hate wine. Wine was the lifeblood of ancient Roman parties. Wine was drunk at every stage of the Roman party, but it had to be diluted with hot or cold water. Unlike how we drink wine today, which would be crazy if you were to dilute it. Whoa. It was looked down upon to drink wine in its purest form. It was served out with ladles, usually by naked and attractive male slaves. To heat the water, the Romans used special boilers, but if you really wanted to be bougie, they would add snow to make it cold. Considering they didn't have fridges back then, imagine the lengths they would have to go to to keep the snow cold. Beyond temperature, Romans absolutely drooled for calda and mulsum. Calda was great for cold nights, it was kind of like a mold wine, it was served hot and infused with spices. Molda was infused with honey and a lot sweeter. I want to try and make both. Maybe I will on my Instagram. Let me know if I should in the comments below. Minus the lead, of course. Number eight, seating charts. If you have ever been involved in a wedding, you know how important a seating chart is. Or like even in school, when you're like assigned desks, it's a big deal. You could end up sitting next to your uncomfortable cousin or beside your smelly Aunt Sue. It could determine whether the conversation flows or it's stagnant the entire night. Ugh, hate that. Romans understood the matchmaking game when it came to banquets. It was a pretty big deal. Where you sat determined your station and overall how liked you were. They had a three couch system called the triclinium. The most honored guests would sit on the couch in the center next to the hosts on the right. But if you were on the couch on the left, it kind of meant that you weren't as big of a deal. Sorry. Eventually as parties got bigger, so did the three couch rule extend to a huge semicircular couch in the middle that could hold about 12 people. Number seven, gladiator fights. We just did a video on this, Taylor and I, go check it out. Now, parties weren't just about eating, drinking, and socializing, there had to be entertainment, of course. Roman parties were designed around the five senses, taste, touch, smell, sight, and hearing. So of course there were the ancient Roman bards jamming out some earworms, but what was there to look at? You could only watch someone play the harp for so long. Next up on the entertainment list was acrobats, dancing girls, even mimes, which I was surprised to learn, plus trained exotic animals. If you were more like the charcuterie and like a quiet evening kind of person, you might enjoy poetry readings. But what really got the party started was an epic gladiatorial battle. Nothing like putting sharp objects in drunk people's hands. But that wasn't all they did. Parties were a big deal and nobles loved to outdo each other, so sometimes they went too far. More than once it got out of hand, but the most famous was during the reign of Emperor Elagabalus. He wanted to shower his dinner guests with flowers, so he built a false ceiling filled with them, but the flowers somehow ended up smothering some of his guests to death because he just kind of went overboard. Death by roses. 
That's a poem title right there. Stick to poetry nights, my friends. Number six, Saturnalia. One of the most popular Roman festivals, it was kind of like an early Christmas celebration, kind of. Except it wasn't at all, it was actually about the god Saturn, not Christ. Oops, but it did take place in December. December 17th, to be precise, for three days. But people loved it so much, it soon got extended to seven, a whole week. All work and businesses were suspended, so better do your shopping on the 16th. Slaves were even temporarily free to do as they pleased, even moral restrictions were eased. A mock king was chosen, and candles, wax fruit, wax statues were all given as presents. The practice of candle giving was to symbolize the sun returning after the winter solstice. A statue of Saturn bound at the feet would be untied and invited to join the party. The houses were adorned with wreaths and greenery, kind of like Christmas, and singing, dancing, gambling were all common features. So kind of of like Mardi Gras and Christmas combined. At right, number five, long skulls. One of the most bizarre beauty trends from ancient times, at least, was the process of head shaping. This unusual beauty trend caused people in modern times to think that aliens were real when remains were discovered with oddly shaped skulls. Some people believe that we had proven the existence of extraterrestrials, but in reality, it led to the discovery of an entire practice of human body modification for the purpose of beauty. The process of head shaping involves putting some kind of pressure on a baby's head so that it grows into a different shape. This was known to be done by using cloth or even boards to create the desired shape. This is one of the oldest beauty trends in history as the earliest evidence of modified skulls come from Australia and date back between 14,000 and 9,000 years ago. The skulls that were found had flattened foreheads and very prominent brow ridges. This practice also occurred quite often in South America where skulls with a variety of different shapes have also been found. I'm kind of glad that we don't do this anymore because I could not imagine going through life with a cone head. I wonder how it would feel to have a head shaped like that. My neck hurts just thinking about it. I number four. Five head. Let's go back to the Renaissance for a bit to talk about yet another one of their super strange beauty trends. They really had a lot of weird desires when it came to appearances, and I'm certainly glad that this next one is no longer in style, and I really hope it never makes a comeback. Back in the Renaissance, it was believed that girls with high curved foreheads were the most beautiful, but obviously not everyone can be built like that. As people do, they came up with a way of achieving this look without having to be born with said attributes. In order to have that big forehead that people so desire, women were known to have shaved or plucked the hairs from their natural hairline to make their foreheads look bigger and therefore more desirable. They really said receding hairline, but make it fashion. Suppose. At number three, feet painting. Now you would think that all of the super bizarre beauty trends of the past were from way back in the day, but you would be mistaken. We saw some strange practices in the 20th century as well, especially during war times. Back in World War II, a shortage of silk and nylon in America created a bizarre beauty trend. Because these materials were needed to make things like parachutes and uniforms for troops, tights were quickly disappearing from stores. Because this was such a huge staple in women's fashion, they got created creative and created a beauty trend where women would draw pantyhose arrows in their legs, dye them with different colors, and try and mimic the look of mesh tights to create an illusion close to wearing stockings. I feel like if this happened in today's time, I don't think I would be that desperate to do that. And you couldn't catch me drawing or dyeing my legs for this. I think I'll just stick to wearing pants. At number two, strange corsets. Corsets have been around for a long time. They've come in and out of style, and even right now, corsets seem to be making their way back into mainstream fashion, though maybe not as extreme as back in the day. In the 19th century, having an hourglass figure was seen as the ideal body type, and so in order for many women to achieve this look, they wore corsets to cinch their waist. However, the looks were pretty extreme. Some women tightened their corsets so tight that their waist could be wrapped with two hands. Like, imagine that. Although this was seen as super chic back in the day, it was also causing some health issues because it would squish together people's organs, and as you can imagine, that's not a good thing. Eventually, corsets evolved so that rather than cinch the waist so much, it would just accentuate the hips to still give an hourglass shape without causing too much bodily harm. And finally, at number one, no-no piercings. How many of you guys out there have piercings? I have a few myself, but I have my ears pierced and obviously my nose is pierced. But there are so many other places that you can get pierced even in the no-no region. Back in the Victorian era, piercings down under were pretty popular and were considered to be very fashionable amongst wealthy women. Some women would have their nippies pierced and even chained together and some men would even get their peepees some jewelry too. 
For women, it was all about trends, but for men back then, many of them got their nether regions pierced supposedly to make wearing tight pants more comfortable. This piercing was called the Prince Albert, and it was given that name based on the legend that Prince Albert got his little prince pierced in order to hide the size of his junk underneath his clothes. Whether or not that's actually true is beyond me, but I would imagine that getting that piercing would be painful. Absolutely painful. At number 10, population. It's pretty messed up just how many slaves there were in ancient Rome. In their society, wealthy people owned dozens if not hundreds of slaves to do their menial work. In ancient Rome, anyone could be sold into slavery. No matter your race or background, if you could work, you could be bought and sold. Historians believe that about 90% of the free people in Italy by the first century BCE had ancestors who were slaves. At one point, the Roman Senate debated having slaves wear uniforms to be able to distinguish them from the rest of society, but they ultimately decided against it when they realized just how many slaves there were. One ancient Roman politician once said, quote, It was once proposed in the Senate that slaves should be distinguished from free people by their dress. But then it was realized how great and danger this would be if our slaves began to count us. End quote. They literally couldn't afford to let the slaves know how many other slaves there were because if they would have known they outnumbered the other members of society, this could have led to a revolt. I mean, there were slave revolts regardless, but we will get to that later. At number nine, lifestyle. Ancient Roman slaves experienced different lifestyles and living conditions based on a number of factors, often linked to their occupations. Slaves who didn't have a specific skill or trade were often used in mines and agriculture, and those were the harshest conditions that they could have been subjected to. Oftentimes, they were literally worked to death, and since they didn't have any human rights in the eyes of the Romans, they were often overlooked and simply replaced. On the other hand, household slaves received more humane treatment. They were treated better by their masters, and sometimes they were able to get some money in order to buy their freedom. If they were able to buy their freedom, the slaves would become freedmen, which was a social class between slaves and free people. Before we continue discussing the hard lives of slaves in ancient Rome, make sure you guys smash that thumbs up button if you're thoroughly entertained so far, and maybe even consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Spartacus. At one point, a group of Roman slaves revolted, and though they eventually lost lost their battle, they survived a pretty long time thanks to one famous slave named Spartacus. Spartacus was a slave who escaped a gladiatorial training camp and recruited thousands of other slaves to fight for their freedom alongside him. For the slaves, Spartacus was their symbol of hope and their leader. This slave army was able to defy Roman authorities for two years with freedom in their sights, but unfortunately those dreams were crushed when Roman general Crassus crushed Spartacus and his army. After Spartacus was killed, the authorities came for the rest of the slaves in the army and they were severely punished. 6,000 slaves who took part in the revolt were crucified, and this was almost a warning to the other slaves against trying to revolt again. Spartacus became a legend, but it wasn't enough to free the Roman slaves. At number 7, Ownership In ancient Rome, slavery and slave ownership was such a common practice that pretty much everyone owned slaves, regardless of social status. Even some of the poorest Roman citizens would own one or two slaves. Obviously, the more money you had back then, the more slaves you could afford. In Roman Egypt, the average artisan owned about two or three slaves each. Emperor Nero was known to have owned over 400 slaves who lived and worked in his home in the city, but his numbers are eclipsed by a wealthy Roman named Gaius Caecilius Isidorus, who according to historical records owned 4,166 slaves at the time of his death. That just gives you an idea of just how many people were sold into slavery in the first place. At number 6, freedom. Earlier I mentioned that Roman slaves had the chance to buy their freedom. It was a lengthy process, but this gave a lot of slaves hope for a better life. Things weren't always better after buying their freedom though, and many of them sold themselves back into slavery because things were tough. The process of buying your freedom as a slave was called manumission. This could be achieved in a number of ways. Slave master could grant their slave freedom as a reward for their service and loyalty. The slave could pay their master a sum of money to be freed, or sometimes a slave master could just find it convenient to let their slave go. Most slave masters who chose that last option to free their slave for their own benefit were merchants who needed someone to be able to sign contracts on their behalf, and since slaves weren't allowed to represent their masters from a legal standpoint, they would be freed, but would still work for their master. You also had to be over the age of 30 to buy your freedom, so if you were lucky to live that long, then there was hope of being freed, but with the average life expectancy in ancient Rome being about 28 years or so, and with the living conditions of many slaves, they would be lucky to get that opportunity. Number 5. Spartan Women Okay, so Athenian women were kind of locked up in the house 
didn't really have much freedom. But Spartan women were actually against the grain as to what was expected of women around that time. They ate as much as men, which was unusual. They weren't forced into marriage as soon as they were able to, so instead of being a mother at 14, it'd be more like 19 or 20 as previously mentioned. They were educated to similar standards of men. They were active and physically strong, which meant criticism from outside societies because they would show off their bodies like, oh my god, her thigh, or she'd be naked, whoa, oh my goodness, like all this stuff. The Spartans believe that the stronger and more intelligent the woman, the better the male offspring would be. Spartan moms were terrifying too. They were really witty and they could like serve you up real quick. Spartan women were also prized for their wit and intellect. They could own and manage property and were proficient in reading, writing, music, and poetry. They were also expected to participate in athletic competitions such as javelin throwing and wrestling, singing, and dancing. The Spartans loved to dance because it showed off the goods. This was also a kind of advertisement to Spartan men to evaluate the mother of their hopefully next son. Child rearing was to women what war was to men. The only way to get your name on a grave was if you died in battle and died in childbirth. Number 4, Diamastigosis. So we know, perfection as a human being was a really big deal to the Spartans. Diamastigosis was one of Sparta's most brutal practices. It was the most extreme test of endurance and a kind of replacement for ritualistic sacrifice. Adolescents were flogged in front of an altar at the sanctuary of Artemis Orthia. It was an annual practice used as both a way to satisfy the gods and as a method of testing a boy's resistance to pain. Until their blood flowed toward the altar, the ceremony didn't stop. The teens who were up to participate in the ritual did everything they could to harden themselves against pain, though some still died as a result. Uh, fun fact though, when the Romans invaded, uh, they actually made this like a huge show and kind of made it like an entertainment instead of just a ritual. It was bad. Number three, Cryptia. Uh, obviously, where there were slaves, a lot of people not cool with it, not gonna be happy, obviously, because it was the worst. You weren't considered human. So, of course, uprising and rebellion is a natural byproduct of treating people like crap. So, any teenage boys who demonstrated intense leadership skills would be selected for the secret police called the Cryptia. Their primary goal was to terrify the Helots into submission and weed out any growing rebellions and troublemakers. If they did find any, then they wouldn't even get a fair trial before they were executed. Pretty damn brutal and follows quite closely the patterns of slavery across the world. However, some scholars say that the Cryptia was also yet another test for the Spartan youth. After intense training, which we will talk about in a minute, they would join the Cryptia, the kind of next step in educational training. Participating in the human practice of punishing helots was part of their learning to become a great Spartan. Number two, agoge training. I've hinted at this the entire time. Being a Spartan boy was hardcore. You think you're hardcore for going to the gym every day guzzling protein shakes and lifting weights. By today's standards, you go man, that's awesome. But compared to Spartan youths, you'd look like a stay puffed marshmallow covered in kittens watching Disney movies. Like that's what you'd look like, you'd be like, you soft man. Agoge was a state sponsored compulsory education system which emphasized obedience, endurance, courage, and self control. By the age of seven, boys were sent to live together and their training began. They used harsh and cruel methods in order to harden the hearts of their future warriors. It literally turned childhood into the breeding ground for what would be considered trauma by today's standards. At age 12, they were stripped of all clothing save a red cloak and forced to sleep outside. They had to make their own shelter, encouraged to forage and steal food for survival, but if they were caught stealing, they were punished severely. Among fierce combat training, they were also taught to read, write, music, and everything else. But by age 30, their training was complete and they were expected to marry as previously mentioned. But seriously, I didn't go into really full details because probably YouTube would get mad, but um, you can imagine, like, whew, beatings, it was nuts. Not a good time. But they were awesome at fighting. Number one, Mount Taigetos. Upon the birth of a Spartan, they went through a kind of Baptist initiation called Pieties. The infant was dumped into a vat of wine, and if they cried, they were considered weak. This last one is honestly truly the most like messed up and super, super metal at the same time. It's really bad. The Spartan youths were first evaluated by a council of elders. In the event they didn't meet their expectations, the babe was placed at the bottom of Mount Peigithos for several days. If they survived, they were celebrated and taken back to the village. 
If they died from exposure, the corpse was left behind. The third option was that the babe disappeared via a sympathetic passerby, which did happen. The parents had to endure this testing of fate, for only a true Spartan could survive the impossible. This list was super fun to make. Crazy, but fun. My last fact about Sparta is that all the info I just presented to you didn't come from Sparta. Everything we know about Sparta came from records from exterior states who interacted with Sparta. They didn't write anything down about themselves, so who knows what else we do or do not know. Number 10. Pressure to perform. In the Middle Ages, either partner in a marriage was entitled to coitus with their partners under any circumstances. It was called the marriage right. This went both ways, and unless you were passionately in love with your partner and straight, this could be a nightmare. It was so sacred you could even get it on in a church and the priest would be like, yep, go for it. Failure to perform in the bedroom or anywhere was grounds for divorce, which was a huge deal at the time. Now the first problem here is a lack of consent, but the biggest problem for men who weren't inclined to sleep with their wives was impotency. There was no sympathy for men in these circumstances. If a wife accused her husband of this, then the couple would have to undergo a bedroom trial, where a crowd of wise elders, mainly grandmothers, aunts, and mothers, would watch the couple in their bedroom for three nights. If you were rich, this was even worse. These trials would be carried out in public in court. Yeah, that's right. The wife had to prove that the husband couldn't get it up in court. Now, he could call on women of the night to prove his prowess, if he was so inclined, but if it was proven that he couldn't, then the couple would be divorced. But the bottom line, the main point of marriage was to have children, and if there weren't any, then this failure was placed heavily on the man. Number nine, beastly justice. I figured I would put a lighthearted one on this list. This actually made me laugh while I was researching it. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. They were also put on trial, like a full trial. It's wild to look back at a knight and the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact that they also had to get up early and like attend these courts, royal courts, where a wild animal was taking the stand. And it actually happened in history. This would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, being confused and all, as most animals are. But the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was involved in this animal's scheme. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself. In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage, so instead of just putting the animals down or setting them free, you know, away from your town, they took them to a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say, we should do a list just on that person alone. What a weird job. These pigs were hung from a gallows tree. A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. The 1400s were a wild time. Uh, Your Honor, due to my client being a pig, um... Number eight, a tanner. Even for a medieval peasant who never washed or clean themselves and literally lived in filth, this was a dirty job. Women were more commonly found in household chores or as milkmaids, barmaids, weavers, artisans, and tenant farmers. This job may have fallen mostly to men, and it was a rough one. I'll tell you. Men would rather go to war than do this job. You had to get skins from a butcher, along with the grime that covered it, which was mostly manure and blood. Then you had to trim the skins and get rid of all the hair. To do this, they had to let the hair follicles rot by sprinkling it with urine or soak it in a wood, ash, and lime solution. Can you tell which one was cheaper? Then they'd scrape off the hair and any skin before washing it again in pigeon droppings or dog poo to remove the lime and make it softer and more flexible. You. Or the craftsmen might use fermented barley or rye with stale beer or urine, again, as an additive. This could take up to three months. Three months plus longer as there was more rinsing and stretching until it could be used. Leather was a crucial resource, so though dirty, it was a really necessary job, but oh my god. No thank you. Number seven, being a knight. Being a knight, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing hair. They're saving the damsel in distress, all that jazz that you picture in your head. It actually sucked being a knight, a lot. First of all, chain mail. You know how heavy chain mail is alone? It's like 55 pounds, and that was underneath all of your armor. No way I could climb up on a horse wearing armor or chainmail. My knees would buckle. No, thank you. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. 
You would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you would become a squire. A knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but okay. But if you stick it out for just seven more years, then you become a knight. And then you can get your chest blown off jousting. Neat. All that time just to get rocked by another bigger dude on a bigger horse. No, just no for me. Number six, death by anything but mostly violence. Life in medieval times was considered basically brutal and short. If it wasn't the plague, it was a cold. If it wasn't disease, it was the weather. If it wasn't the weather, it was famine. If it wasn't famine, it was violence everywhere else. It was a damn miracle if you survived childhood. If you had to pick any other time in history to live, like you couldn't live in this one, Taylor asked me this earlier and I had a response, but it definitely wasn't this time. Literally block this time period from your mind. Between 1330 to 1479, men could expect to die nine years sooner than their female counterparts. The reason was violence against men by other men. But the biggest factor that made especially men's lives so short was the violence, as I mentioned. Think about it. It was men who were often called to war with only their farming tools, or if they were proper soldiers, they would have had more. But they were called off to do jobs that literally required them to kill or be killed. Homicide levels in medieval England were around 10 times higher than they are today. This isn't to say at all that women were excluded from this, they were mostly the victims of this violence, but there was a culture around men that expected them to take part in violence to the extreme. From drunken brawls, to duels, to playful sword fights gone wrong, torment, there was a lot going on. Male gangs were responsible for most of the mayhem as they were bolstered with the need to prove themselves. But also, if you were about to get mugged in an alleyway and somebody wanted to fight you, which was very likely because everyone was on edge, it was good to have backup. Number five, Queen Isabella I. The Spanish Inquisition, pretty high up there as far as terrifying points in history go. If you weren't willing to convert to Catholicism, you were tormented, interrogated, and burned at the stake. Who was behind this awful time in history? This lady, Queen Isabella I. Technically, as she was fighting for a holy order for the Catholic Church, this can be seen as holy, but was it? Burning people at the stake because they didn't share this belief? Ah, not cool, Isabel. She created a secular government through her reign, which allowed for the monarchy to have more power. Being a pious Catholic, she made Catholicism the official religion and created a tribunal to make this happen. Secret service or a secret police that spread fear wherever they went. Her direct influence caused the Jewish population to falter for a really long time after. Number four, Friedegan of Soissons. Okay, I maybe said that wrong, so I apologize. Kind of impressed with her rise to power. She went from slave attendant to queen. How do you bridge that gap? No idea. Boy, was she ferocious. Assassination and manipulation were her main political tools. Fritigan was among a small number of enslaved women in the Merovingian household that became a queen. Merovingian was the OG Central Europe before everything got split up. She survived political dangers and retained her husband's loyalty and could persuade monks and priests to jump onto her plots with ease. She encouraged her husband, the king, to set aside his first wife and then even take the life of his second. But his second wife, Galswinda, had a a sister named Brunhild, who became the mortal enemy of Fredegund. She had good reason to be. Fredegund continued to do everything she could to secure her position, one assassination after the next. She was a pretty stormy lady. Number three, Bathory. Okay, 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 all right. Technically not a queen, I get it, but she might as well have been with the power that she had. So fight me. She's remembered as the most evil woman in the world in history, I think, I don't know. That's my opinion. Bathory was the stuff of nightmares. Elizabeth Bathory was born on August 7th, 1560 into a prominent Hungarian noble family, making her practically untouchable. She married a very famous war hero who is suspected of gifting Bloody Lizzie with the skills she used to kill. After she died, Bathory became obsessed with immortality. Supposedly when one of her servants accidentally spilt blood on her and her skin appeared younger after. Bathory then began her mission of horror, luring over 650 young virgin women to her palace and brutally taking their lives. She was even bold enough to lure daughters of nobility. Before draining them of their blood, she would make them suffer in ways you don't even want to imagine before bathing in the blood itself. When she was finally caught, three of her servants were executed, but she was simply locked away in her tower for the rest of her days on house arrest. 
Ugh. Number two, Catherine de Medici, also known as the Serpent Queen. History colors her story as the tale of the evil queen. On one hand, she is remembered for being one of the most powerful French queens in history, and then on the other, she was blamed for the many atrocities that took place during her reign. Her regency was marked by the French wars of religion and the many games Catherine played within them. The Catholics and the Protestants, as previously mentioned, were at war, and she spent a lot of time trying to find peace. Kind of. But she was a passionate Catholic and is believed to have tried to remove a Protestant general from her son's side. When he survived the attack, she lied and convinced her son that the Protestants were responsible, so she scapegoated them. So he authorized taking the lives of their leaders. Enter St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Catherine implicated the general, which resulted in him being the first to be beaten and then tossed out of his own bedroom window. An estimated 3,000 French Protestants were taken out in Paris, but the total countrywide was around 70,000. And last but not least, Bloody Mary, actually known as Queen Mary the First of England. So no, I'm not talking about the girl you say in the mirror three times so that she appears and you're like, wow, I'm haunted forever. Queen Mary became known as Bloody Mary due to her vicious tirade against Protestants in England during her reign. She even imprisoned her own sister, Elizabeth, who we mentioned at the beginning of this list, due to suspicions of treason. This was unfounded. She bore her father, Henry VIII, ill will after the stuff he pulled with the church and after having delegitimized her as his heir for a time. After Mary took the throne and married the Catholic King of Spain, she began carrying out her plan for England to become Catholic once again. In 1555, she revived England's heresy laws and began burning offenders at the stake, starting with her father's longtime advisor, Thomas Kramer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. She burned over 300 convicted heretics, most of them being common citizens, and dozens more died in prison, hence giving her the name of Bloody Mary. At number 10, painting veins. Back in the 17th century in Europe, many people believed that extreme paleness was just the hottest thing. If you looked whiter than a ghost, then you were like the Megan Fox of the town. Many women were obsessed with finding new ways of making themselves look pastier than a white wall, and some of their methods were actually surprisingly creative. The cosmetic skills of women back then were actually pretty impressive, I must say. Wealthy aristocratic women were the ones who took part in this pale trend the most. They wore dresses with plunging necklines to show off the girls and they painted themselves white using a powder. Frankly, this powder made them look pretty artificial, like you could tell that they weren't actually naturally that white, so to solve this they came up with a new beauty trend, drawing veins. Women would draw veins on their mommy milkers using a blue color to mimic the look of translucent skin. It's crazy to think how far we've come from this, because back then people were trying to look as pale as possible and now we have people tanning themselves so much that it causes controversy. At number 9, Tiny Tea. During the Renaissance, fashion and beauty standards were changed drastically from what was popular in the years before. So much in society changed over this period of time, like what was seen as beautiful or desirable. Things like certain body types and other physical attributes had their own trends, but one of the weirdest physical beauty trends from back then had to do with teeth. Back then, the ideal woman had wide hips, a small waist, long legs, and small teeth. Yeah. Teeth had an ideal size. To people back then, the smaller the teeth, the more desirable you were. Why? I don't know. Because people are weird, I guess. Some people would even go as far as to file their teeth down to make them smaller so that people would see them as more attractive. Now, I can imagine that this would be a very painful process. Like if you've ever chipped a tooth, then you know that uncomfortable, almost cold sensation of a broken tooth. So imagine that, but on all of your teeth. Yeah, you can count me out. Before we carry on talking about some of these strange things people did to be the belle of the ball, and yeah, there were some really, really weird things, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Nails for Days. These days, people get their nails done all the time. I love seeing crazy nail art videos online because they're often so creative. Some of the most fascinating ones are the crazy long nails. I don't think I could ever rock those, but I still admire those who can. The beauty trend of having long nails, though, isn't a new thing. It's been a symbol of beauty and status for many, many years, like years ago in China. Back then, having super long nails was seen as a way to show off your wealth and status. The average nail length amongst Chinese aristocrats was up to 25 centimeters or nearly 10 inches. This was all their natural nails too. And in order to protect their insanely long nails from breaking, they wore nail guards made out of gold. 
Not only did that protect their nails, but it was also another way of showing off their wealth because not everyone can live their lives wearing gold cages on their fingers. As you could imagine, having nails that long made it so you could barely do anything with your hands, and so that's why these aristocrats had servants, so they could perform the tasks that someone with super long nails couldn't. But would you ever want to have nails that long? At number 7, long neck style. In many cultures around the world and for many years, having a long neck was considered beautiful and so many women practice neck stretching in order to attain this level of beauty. This practice of neck stretching has been most commonly done by wearing metal rings around the neck, adding more and more rings over time. This practice was first seen sometime around the 11th century in Southeast Asia. The theory behind the rings is that they're so thick that they push the head up, therefore stretching the neck, but in actuality, the length Lengthening of the neck is caused by the rings pushing down on the collarbones. The origin of this practice is pretty much unknown, but it is theorized that it began as a way to make women look more attractive in order to prevent getting captured as slaves. But on the other hand, some people believe that this was a way of protecting people from getting attacked by tigers. Two very different theories, but nonetheless valid. Though this practice began so long ago, it is still a traditional body modification in some parts of the world to this day. At number 6, Tiny Tootsies. For many years, having the tiniest feet was seen as a popular beauty trend in China. Foot binding was a big body modification practice in China that began in the 10th century AD. It is said that this whole trend started because a court dancer bound her feet and the emperor at the time, Emperor Li Yu, really liked what he saw and soon it was encouraged for other women to do the same. Soon this practice of foot binding became a huge trend and it became associated with being able to find a husband. The practice of foot binding began when a girl was 5 or 6 years old. They would have their feet put in hot water, have their nails cut short, and have their skin rubbed with oil before having their four smallest toes broken, folded over, and tied down. Then their feet would be bent in the middle to break the arch, and the girl would have to walk around like that over time, crushing the heel and sole of the foot. After about two years, the foot would be considered ready, and depending on the size of the girl's foot by the end, this would judge how easily she'd be able to be matched with a good husband. This practice continued all the way until the 20th century, where it started to lose popularity. Number five, the Black Banquet. A prank that went down in history. Don't worry, this is nothing like GOT's. Red Wedding, thank goodness. Emperor Dominion had a pretty sick sense of humor and decided to host a party about it. In 90 AD, he invited a crowd of aristocrats to a banquet at Palatine Hill. When they arrived, the entire palace was decorated in black. Black velvet drapes, marble, everything was painted black like the Rolling Stones song. Even the food was black and everything was illuminated by funeral lamps. Naked serving boys were painted from head to toe in black paint and served food and drink to all the guests. When they sat down, their place marks were, were tombs with their names on it, and instead of lush couches, they sat on cement slabs. So basically, he was like, yeah, sit in your own grave. Dominion had killed several senators in the past, so everyone believed that they were never going to get out of there alive. It was like a huge metaphor for their own deaths. The emperor himself babbled about death and decay the entire night. So after the party was over and the guests made it home with their necks intact, Dominion sent gift baggies with their tombstones and onyx plates, and a now clean serving boy ready to do their bidding. Turns out the whole thing was a prank and the emperor was back at the palace laughing his butt off. Number 4 Bacchanalia. The party that was so wild it got banned. One word, orgies. The Romans dug that kind of kinky shindig but they like to pretend they didn't. Bacchanalia the bad guy, is a term used to describe a drunken, debaucherous party at frat houses or sororities, which isn't far off from the heyday. The Bacchanal celebrates the god Dionysus, also known as Bacchus, literally the god of wine and a damn good time. The celebration could include massive feasts, ritual parades and performances, and people carrying clusters of grapes around, and of course, wine. Lots and lots of wine. It used to just be held by women three times a year, but soon men were slowly admitted to the festivities and they started making it happen about five times a month. But this was the breeding ground for scandal as it was rumored orgies and even human sacrifice occurred. So they were banned in 186 BCE and if you ban something, you'll only make it more popular so the celebrations continued covertly. So if you're into that kind of stuff, maybe forgo the human sacrifice button. There it is. Number three, power play party. 
I've never lived within the aristocracy. I'm a blue collar gal. I'm never gonna know what it's like to be that rich. But I'm pretty sure this kind of who can throw the bigger party mentality hasn't really changed. In ancient Rome, parties were an opportunity to show off the amount of power a nobleman had. As soon as guests arrived, the extravagance and the rarity of the food, the vessels with which they were presented, were all judged as soon as they were seen. Wine goblets and jugs had to be functional yet exquisite, made from luxurious materials like gold, silver, and precious stones. Back then, a middle class family could afford silverware, so imagine what the nobles could do. This display of wealth played the long game, and it could mean political favors could be made down the road. So, sneaky sneaky. Number two, Party Island. This is where it gets really dark. Ever sipped on a Capri Sun? Well, this story may taint that memory, so fair warning. The island of Capri became a rich retreat for the Roman aristocracy, known for its sadistic debauchery. Emperor Tiberius laid claim to this island as a haven for his horrendous and horrific, horrific behavior. He brought really young, too young male and female people of the night to serve him at his villa. The island became a kind of party place with absolutely no limits. From orgies in the caves to tormenting his servants on the rack as entertainment, Tiberius seemed to be the god Pan incarnate. In fact, he acted like it too. He made all of his participants slaves dress up as nymphs and goats while performing lewd acts. The island even became known as Goat Island with Tiberius being called the Old Goat. Ugh. Unless you enjoy dangerous games and gross parties, this definitely wasn't the party island fit for anyone. And last but not least, number one, Caligula. Caligula's parties. Let's not go there. If you're a fan of Roman history, then you are familiar with the two most horrific emperors that ever were. One of them was Caligula. Though he started out pretty good, after an extreme bout of fever, his disposition entirely changed. Maybe it was because of the lead, we don't know. Many believed he was insane, as his cruelty knew no bounds, even when it came to joy occasions. Caligula's thing was that he liked to embarrass the wives of his officials for some reason and also his officials. He would force specifically married couples to his banquets and then steal the wives away throughout the night and then violate them against their wishes. But his torment doesn't end there. He would then relay to the entire party everything that he did in graphic detail and enjoy the frozen shock on everyone's faces because they couldn't do anything about it. It's no wonder he was eventually assassinated. Even at a party, this guy knew how to kill the mood. He wasn't the only emperor to turn the dial on creepy, Tiberius, when the party started, but if you had to choose whose party to go to, this one plus Tiberius, both of them. Just don't go near them. Go to another time frame. Just imagine it otherwise. And there we have it folks, from poisoning themselves to bliss to pure and simple crime, that's ramen parties for you. Number 10, not bathing. Let's start off strong. So obviously hindsight is 2020. We know a lot of, more about personal hygiene now than we did you know, then and as well in like middle school because high school locker rooms, what the heck. Without the knowledge of germs and disease, not bathing seemed like the logical next step for a lot of people, even though it made you smelly as all heck. When the pilgrims arrived in Native America on the Mayflower, the indigenous tribes often referred to their horrid smell. An account from a member of the Patuax Nation even tried to convince them to start washing themselves. They were like, come on guys. It's enough. They washed their hands and faces, but they rarely washed their whole bodies. Though they believed cleanliness was next to godliness, that didn't necessarily mean they needed water to do it. They believed that should they submerge themselves, they risk disease. This could be because they dumped their daily duties into the water, so you know, that's, that's likely. So instead they took dry baths where they wiped themselves down with a dry cloth. But this, that it, it didn't really help much. Number nine, bedpans. It's always the worst when you get tucked in at night, you start to fall asleep, you're starting to doze off, and then you realize you need to pee. It's the worst, you gotta get up, walk down that long scary hallway, blind yourself for two minutes, and then get cozy all over again. Well, in the Middle Ages, you would just toss your full bedpan out the window. Easy peasy, heads up, oh, oops, <laughs> it's so gross. Or sometimes, if you're feeling a little lazy, this was also common, you would use the bedpan and then just slide it back underneath your bed and go right back to sleep. If anybody ever gives you shit for having cups in your room, show them this video, show them this history. You're fine, you're not that bad. Back in those days, we weren't exactly aware of the disease that we threw out the window as well. 
Most of the time it was number one, so the rain could just, you know, wash away the yuck. But these buildings were only one story. There wasn't, it wasn't going anywhere. If you were tossing anything out, you'd be stepping over it the next morning on the way to, you know, the public execution or whatever. Number eight, a lead facial. Today, if you have tan skin from that hot summer glow, it implies that you have had enough leisure time to acquire such a hue. Getting a tan is the thing unless you're like me and slather on that sunscreen for health. And so you look like a newborn baby when you're 80 years old. However, it was the opposite in times of old. If you had sun kissed skin, that meant you worked hard in the fields, a symbol that you were a peasant or of lower class. If you were rich, you tended to have much paler skin, therefore implying your status. But simply staying out of the sun wasn't enough. Elizabeth I used a combination of lead and vinegar to achieve a bright white complexion and to hide her smallpox scars. The compound was called ceruse. This tradition even goes all the way back to women in the Roman Empire. Empire. A well known actress named Kitty Fisher was also said to have died from the material as it slowly poisoned her with daily use. The material would add blisters, so she put more on to cover it up. Same with Elizabeth, and yes, slowly you understand. Number seven, Victorian Laundry Day. You spill some mustard on your shirt today, that stain will be gone by the time you get home. We're pretty advanced when it comes to quick stain removal today, but like the Romans, which I'll talk about later, it wasn't always smooth sailing. Take the 18th century, for example, when Laundry Day came around. It was an event. It was like an ultimate chore. They had to take daylight in consideration and plan their washing days, as in more than one. The Victorian era was exhausting. They would soak their clothes overnight, then the next day would be spent soaping them up, boiling them, rinsing, soaping again, rinsing again, maybe soap one more in case you know there's too much pee pee, and then rinsed another time, wrung out, mangled, laid out to dry. Hence the sunlight timing, starched and then slowly ironed. Cut to today, we have to encourage adults not to eat Tide Pods or drink bleach. We'll get there, maybe, I don't know. Number six, wigs and makeup. When you don't bathe and are overall just smelly, you're gonna need to do something to cover up whatever the heck is building up beneath that bodice. Wigs would have never become as popular if it weren't for a very specific venereal disease called syphilis. By 1580, the STD was the worst epidemic since the Black Death. Patients clogged hospitals and without antibiotics or protection, things got pretty nasty. Sores, blindness, rashes, dementia, and patchy hair loss. Thus, for the sake of keeping up appearances, wigs came into fashion. Also the makeup I mentioned before. Balding was a huge humiliation, so they made wigs out of horse, goat, and or human hair. They also cover the wigs in powdered, scented with lavender or orange to hide any foul odors, and as we suspect, there were a lot of foul odors. They weren't stylish until 1655 when the King of France started losing his hair and had 48 wigs made. Then five years later, his cousin Charles II of England joined the train and suddenly powdered wigs became like the next best thing. Wigs did help curb the lice problem though because the human hair had to be shaved in order for the perukes to be worn. But the wigs themselves had to be deloused often. And yeah. Number five. Urine deep. Turns out we used pee for a lot of things back in the day, and today we still do? Question mark? The Romans used urine to wash their clothes, and even more impressive slash gross is the fact that they used urine to help with inflammation, burns, or skin disease. Yeah, pee was the number one trick. Get it, number one? I, okay, we'll move on. Best way to whiten that smile was not a crest white strip, but rather a facial mask dip, dipped, dipped in the mellow yellow. Just pee. Because it's so gross. We mentioned on this channel before that gladiator sweat was once bottled and then sold. Well, their pee as well was sold as this beauty product. Clean out those pores with a drop of Igor. Mm. Get it while it's hot, folks. This is extremely gross, obviously, but it does make sense. The ammonia in urine kicks stains away for good. That's why they would wash their clothes in the same way. Now we get it. History. Gross. Uh, number four, rush plants. Today we use chic shag carpets that, you know, really tie the room together. Sips white Russian. But back in the olden times, they used something called the rush plant to pad their floors. But the thing was, this layer of dense plant material was a breeding ground for nits, ticks, and other creepy crawlies. It was it was a really unsanitary situation, but well, like what else were you supposed to do? However, this kind of flooring made them vulnerable to disease and infection. The reason being, as these floors would not be renewed for sometimes 20 years. The bottom layer, left undisturbed, would accumulate a lot of really gross stuff like uh, animal droppings, feces, the piece of grizzle you dropped that one time, fish craps, whatever. So um, 
it was just not, it was like basically a swamp down there. Number three, royal bum. The groom of the stool is a little bit different than the groom of a wedding. It was perhaps one of the worst jobs to have, but, but, pun intended, it's one of the most important roles. The groom of the king's close stool was a position created during King Henry VIII's reign. Their job was to wipe the king's butt. And if that doesn't sound horrible enough, this poor lad would carry the king's stool with him, like on his back, like a Jansport, and then monitor the king's meal times, and they would plan their day around when they thought the king would take a shit. I would be so anxious if a guy wearing a box toilet was just hanging out near me. He's like, hey, you feeling all right, boss? You good? You feeling full? That was a lot of bread earlier. You sure? All right, take five. Just, I don't know. Just take a look. I don't know. I'll let you be. Just jump. You must be thinking, what poor soul got stuck with this job? Well, this job was an honor, my friend. Sons of noblemen were awarded this role. You would get pretty close to the king, I mean, obviously, but as time went on, these grooms became secretaries to that king. Pretty good upgrade. Eventually, getting a higher pay and benefits. Yeah, I would hope so. Even the king's walking, talking toilet gets dental back in the day. How neat is that? Number two, eagle dung. I'm honestly not even sure what to say about this. You know, you have to have some kind of magnificent conviction to be like, I have no reason to believe this is true, but I am 110% sure that bird dung will fix it. Like that's some kind of confidence I don't think I'm ever gonna get. Eagle dung was a common substance found in the birthing room of all places. It was often rubbed in to alleviate the pain, most often accompanied by rose water because who wants to smell that while well, they're bringing life to the world? No one, obviously. Obviously that didn't work and the bacteria from the stuff probably didn't help their recovery either. They also used to place amulets and charms on the stomach to speed contractions and put coriander on the thighs. Coriander was believed to attract the baby out of the womb. A risky move considering people either love or hate coriander. There's no in between. It either tastes like soap or it's the best thing you've ever had. If the delivery was proving difficult, they would open covered doors, untie hair and perform other metaphors to help the mother deliver easier. But it's the eagle dung that really gets me here, folks. I, I, have, no, I have no excuse for them. Number one, the dirty dead. What feels like a never ending maze, the catacombs under Paris stretch for hundreds of miles. They're a big tourist attraction, obviously, today. Horror movies have been made about these catacombs, just these walls of skulls. But where did they come from? Why were they put there? Also, how bad was that smell? See, originally the tunnels were built for Paris stone mines, but near the end of the 18th century, its purpose started to shift. Cemeteries were starting to pile up, and I mean that in a literal sense, disgusting. There was nowhere to put all these bodies, and everybody else started to get sick because of them, because they were breathing in, you know, dad corpse hot dog breath. They didn't quite know how to handle the dead in a clean way, so they just wanted these bodies out of sight and out of mind. So all these dead bodies that were laying in alleys or on the side of the road, they were gathered and then tossed under the city in these tunnels. These tunnels have been there for centuries before them, so you might as well put them to good use. And by good use, I mean let's just stack skulls in an orderly fashion and terrorize civilians for centuries to come. Beautiful. Number 10, the cutting edge. So I feel like I have to start here because this really was the prima donna of the revolution. One of the reasons the French Revolution became such a bloody event was due to the guillotine. It became the primary symbol of the French Revolution as the peasants exacted revenge on the aristocracy. It became known as the National Razor and Madame la Guillotine. Prior to the events of the revolution, executions were much more violent and cruel if you can believe that. One involved quartering, which uh, we won't get into, but you can imagine how bad that is if you take that literally. But Dr. Joseph Guillotine, a member of the French National Assembly, argued that there should be a painless and private capital punishment, and even argued against capital punishment in general. He didn't want it to happen. So Dr. Guillotine, along with a German and a harpsichord maker, Tobias Schmidt, invented the first prototype for the death machine. From there, the rest was history. It is estimated over 40,000 people were executed à la raison during the reign of terror. Pretty bad for a guy who really didn't want it to happen, but hey, at least it was painless. If the blade was sharp. If it wasn't, ugh. Number nine, the national anthem. Uh, you know what's funny about going to theater school is that the more you learn, the more your teachers are like, hey, if something bad happens to you, you can use it. It's fuel for your art which is what immediately what I thought of when I heard this story. Which is why, to me, it kind of 
make sense that the origins of the French national anthem happened during the French Revolution. They used their pain to make something good. Going through something dramatic? Sing about it. The monarchies of Europe were pretty pissed about the fact that they were killing a bunch of their friends and loved ones, so they formed a coalition to defeat the resistance and restore the monarchy. The French Baron Philippe Friedrich Dietrich requested that Rouget de Lis, another French officer, compose a song that would rally the troops. So he wrote the first anthem called Chant de Guerre pour l'Arme de Rhin, which translates to War for the Army of Rhin. Volunteers carried the anthem all throughout the streets of Paris as they marched on the capital. The song title got subbed out for the simpler one called the Marseillaise, which became the Republic's anthem in 1795. And now, even today, it is the national anthem of France. Number eight, the tennis court oath. You'd think it would be like at a pub or on the street. Why I think that, I don't know. But it wasn't. One of the earliest acts of defiance in the French Revolution took place on a tennis court of all places. To say that Louis XVI was ill-equipped to handle the financial debt that his father and his grandfather built prior to his reign is kind of, well, it's an understatement. He had no clue. He made a desperate attempt in 1789 to address the economic issues by assembling the Estates Generales. It was a national assembly with three factions, each one representing either the nobles, the clergy, and the commoners. The third estates, which is the commoners, had the most members and declared themselves the National Assembly. There was a long list, a long list of overdue grievances and they declared that they would force a new constitution on the king. Initially things were looking up as Louis legalized the assembly, but he locked them out of the damn meeting. So they moved to an indoor tennis court and took an oath to never disband until a new written constitution was formed for France. But very soon after that, they stormed the Bastille. But we'll get to the Bastille later. Number seven, give us bread. The French Revolution very much erupted due to the financial distress of the people. But the tipping point was the moment bread became unattainable to the common Parisian. Bread is a huge thing in France and it was a huge kind of staple meal for every Parisian. Marie Antoinette Antoinette's famous misquoted response to the people asking for bread was, let them eat cake. Though it's debated whether she actually said that, it does summarize this yeasty flashpoint in history. They should have known better. In 1529, riots over grain and the Great Rebellion led to thousands of peasants destroying houses of the rich all in the name of grain. But they didn't listen to their history, they made it worse. The king was counseled by the physiocrats since the 1760s who firmly believed that the wealth of the nation was derived solely from the value of the land. Therefore, agricultural products should be highly priced. Uh. So they tried to intermittently deregulate the domestic trade to introduce free trade, but needless to say, they failed so hard. They caused food shortages and skyrocketed prices, which erupted in the flour war over 300 riots to pillage grain in 1775. Layers and layers of tensions were added, along with other economic distress and all this stuff, added to the fuel of the blaze that would be later the French Revolution. Number six, flip a coin. Now, the royal family obviously didn't go willingly to their deaths. They at first tried to escape. As I previously mentioned, bread was a big deal. And on October 5th, 1789, a large crowd of mostly women began to assemble at the markets. Why were they there? To discuss the steep price of bread. But they were dismissed, so they marched from Paris to the Palace of Versailles and stormed the place. They took out several guards and chanted over and over to the king, live among the people. Louis, Seated, he said, yeah, okay, and agreed to go with them to Paris. Agreed, kind of. But meanwhile, the royal family was placed under protection, and on the night of June 1971, the nobles dressed as their servants, and their servants dressed as them, and the nobles made an attempt to escape to Austria. Now, if it were 2021, the king would probably have some arrogant social media, so everyone would know what he looked like, but the commoners outside didn't. They had no pictures of him, so it was the perfect disguise. But his face was on every coin in France and it was because of this he was recognized at the border and sent back. Now we know what happened next. Number five, last words. While she was alive, Marie Antoinette was abhorred, absolutely detested, they hated her. But funny enough, today she's incredibly well loved. Historians believe that due to rumors and hatred of the time, her character was misinterpreted. What do I think? Well, she was the product of the aristocracy that pretty much poisoned their own well. 
she was a bystander. But one of the moments that leads people to believe in her kinder nature was her last words. As Marie Antoinette walked up to the guillotine on October 16th, 1793, she stepped on the foot of her executioner by accident. Some say it was something else, but either way, her last words were reported as, I'm sorry. Number four, the Bastille. Bastille, Bastille, Bastille. What am I talking about? It seems wrong not to mention one of the most pivotal moments in the French Revolution, the storming of the Bastille. Peasants rose up and literally stormed the most famous prison in France. But what you may not know is that they destroyed that building with their own bare hands. They tore it brick from brick because they didn't have any explosives. The Bastille was a fearsome 100 feet high, eight towered prison that became a symbol for the tyranny of the aristocrats. So it was only natural that they would take out their anger on this place. At dawn on July 14th, a crowd armed with only muskets, swords, makeshift weapons gathered around the Bastille. Their intent was to demand the ammunition stored there from the governor of the prison, the Marquis de Lanay. He and his men were eventually overwhelmed and the people stormed it. Lanay raised a white flag and surrendered. He and his men were taken into custody, gunpowder and cannons were seized, and seven prisoners were freed. Lanay was destroyed by the mob before he even met trial. This pivotal moment in history is celebrated as the French national holiday, even today. Number three, Charlotte Corday, assassin of Marat. So we have established a couple things. One is that the French Revolution was bloody, relentless, and pretty terrifying. As much as it proved the statement that people shouldn't be afraid of their governments, but the other way around, Alan Moore, V for Vendetta, it wasn't a great place to be. Enter Charlotte Corday. Charlotte was a passionate supporter of the revolution, even though its main conspirators were set on killing the likes of her. Charlotte was, after all, a noblewoman, though she opposed the reign of terror. There were two sides to the fray, the Girondists and the Jacobins, and Charlotte fought alongside the first, the Girondists. But the Jacobins were radical and tried to kill any and all oppositionists, the Girondists included. Which is why Charlotte decided that Jean Paul Marat, leader of the Jacobins, had to be taken out. She became an assassin. While Marat was taking a bath, Charlotte stormed in. She bought a knife and disguised as an informant went in to speak with him. She said she had news. At first, she delivered on her offer and told him of the escaped Girondists. At, he at once said that they would be guillotined and so she whipped out her knife and popped his bath bubbles for good. Corday knew she was going to be caught, however, and had told no one, not even her family, her plan so they wouldn't stop her. Charlotte was guillotined July 17, 1793 with her name attached to her dress so she would be recognized. She wrote in a letter explaining her actions, I desire only that my head, carried through Paris, may be a rallying standard for all the friends of the law. Number two, public zoo. Did you know that in the middle of all that crazy turmoil and public executions, they managed to find time to open a public zoo? In 1793, the National Assembly declared that all privately owned exotic animals will be transferred to the menagerie at the Palace of Versailles or killed, stuffed, and donated to scientists. Gladly though, the animals' lives were spared and the menagerie was reopened as a zoo. It was free to the public and peasants got to go see exotic animals for the first time. Jacques-Henri Bernardin de Saint-Pierre the founder, passionately believed that the public should be educated about exotic animals. Now I can't be sure how well the animals were treated, I assume it wasn't very great, but this was technically the first zoo. Number one, Maximilien Robespierre. Now it only seems fitting that we end this list at the end. Maximilien Robespierre started out with good intentions, but even though the revolution was about the dismantling of power, Maximilien became corrupted by it. Yes, he did topple the monarchy and put the power back to the people, but then he took it back for himself and got a little crazy, you know the whole thing. Robespierre worked as a lawyer in France and focused a lot of his cases towards the underprivileged classes. This got him a lot of popularity and he eventually rose to be the poster child of the revolution, the leader of the revolution. He became the head of public safety after Louis and Marie lost their heads and continued to accuse many members of the national convention of treasonous and unrevolutionary activities all over the place. Remember the whole thing between the Girondists and the Jacobins? This was that. In less than a year, 300,000 people were arrested, 10,000 died in prison, and 17,000 were guillotined. I think those numbers might be slightly off, but that's kind of what the research said. One by one, he sent them all to the guillotine until he eventually was elected the president of the National Convention. Within six days, he passed a law that suspended the right to a public trial and to legal assistance, and by the end of that month, and by the end of that month, 1,400 were guillotined. Talk about trigger happy. Finally, the right and the left had to reunite in order to overthrow him. <laughs> 
and he was eventually met the blade himself. Kicking off the list at number 10, medieval manicures. You can clip your toenails anywhere you want these days. An alarming amount of people do it on airplanes, apparently. Yuck. But how do we clip those little piggies back in the day? Before modern fingernail clippers were patented in 1875, we have to look to the ancient Romans and how they got rid of those hangnails. Biting them off, of course. That was the best way. That bad habit I'm sure half of you have, as well as me. That was the best way. Boink. Eating the, eating the nails, bad, bad stuff. In 35 BC, biting nails was written as a way of dealing with nervousness. Even back then, anxiety still had, it was a thing, of course. Ancient Greeks had a tool that looked a lot like toenail clippers, but it was actually used for pulling hairs. I'll get into that one a little bit later. It's a bit more intense. Medieval methods for cutting your nails were usually to use a small knife, so around the Babylonian age, the newly invented scissors would just do the trick as well. You just gotta have really good aim. They're big, rusty, giant, comedically big scissors almost. Sandpaper was also commonly used as well, and to that, I say, great idea. We still use that today. Number nine, hot pokers. Okay, I absolutely hate this so much. It makes me cringe, and it will probably do the same to you. No wonder people are actually afraid of going to the doctors. Their ancestors had good reason to be. It was pretty much comparable to going to a torture clinic. Yeah. Though I have to say there was some sense behind this one. If you were to receive an injury where the loss of blood could be fatal, cauterizing the wound was a good way to stop it. But it would definitely suck. They would heat up a hot poker and apply it directly to the wound without the luxury of any painkillers. Obviously, this would be extremely painful. Would I rather bleed out? Or have this done? I honestly don't know. However, it would probably result in infection if not treated properly, especially considering that they didn't wash their damn hands as we found out in the previous video. But they wouldn't just use hot pokers for blood wounds, they would also use them to burn off hemorrhoids and STDs and I don't know, hopes and dreams. It was a bad time. Number eight, clamshell hair removal. Whew, here we go. Nowadays you can laser off any unwanted hair. Waxing as well, sounds like an absolute nightmare, but compared to how it used to be done, it's still our best method today. Looking back to around 100,000 years ago, long before Gillette had their nine blade razors with cooling gels and all that good shit, we had to use seashells, literal Seashells. And when I say seashells, I don't mean they would glide across the skin and, you know, Sweeney Todd themselves. No, they would use two shells and then put them together as tweezers and pluck the hairs out one by one. Seashells. Can you hear that? It's the sound of our ancestors plucking their eyebrows. They're still screaming. Sharpened clamshells were used later in the 19th century and we realized if they're flat enough, we can swipe them off. So they were sharpening shells. Eventually they got to the gliding technique. Saves time, but still it was horrible. And if that sounds bad, 30,000 years ago, we used flint blades to shave. Yeah, just remember, when you nick yourself, it can always be better. Number seven, mouse skins. It honestly seems like we really can't get our eyebrows right. In the early 2000s, they were plucked within an inch of their life. Today, we have brow pencils, waxing, soap brows, which I really don't understand. Back in Elizabethan times, they were plucked entirely off of the face to make foreheads look bigger. And now there's this trend. Eventually, bountiful eyebrows came back into fashion, and for those women who weren't blessed with such brows, resorted to mouse traps. That's right, in order to get that luscious furry frame above their eyes, they would catch mice, skin them, and apply them to their eyes. Yay. In the 17th and 18th century, more specifically, women of nobility were known for shaving off their eyebrows entirely and stick on the mouse skin. It was better if the mice had really dark fur because the popular look of the time was pale skin and black eyebrows. Gee, I wonder where Snow White came from. But even more hilariously, <laughs> They would place their brows higher than normal so they walked around looking surprised all the time. Imagine one of them receiving the worst news possible while simultaneously looking like they just won the lottery. Also, the glue wasn't very good, so they would fall off at leisure. Your mom died. Oh no, like what the heck? Number six, horsehair dental floss. Yeehaw, okay, despite how annoying dentists can be sometimes, flossing is vital when it comes to mouth cleanliness. But using horses' hairs to do so, that just sounds counterproductive, no? Early human remains were studied and it showed these grooves in between their teeth. So they would sharpen these little sticks on both sides or use horse hair to get those hard to reach places. Even back then, way in ancient times. If it wasn't horse hair, it was thin, long twigs. Honestly, I'd rather use the twigs. At least that has like a scent of some sort. I don't know, like mint, minto green, something like that, horse. 
back? No. It really wasn't until 1815 until a New Orleans dentist named Levi Spear started to use silk thread to floss in between the teeth instead of hair. Thank you, Levi. As fun as horse hair flossing sounds, I'm gonna stick to the spearmint. S spearmint, Levi Spear. Wait a minute. Number five, crocodile done the deed. Again, I'm saying this again. Who had the gall? Who had the damn audacity to look at a steaming pile of, of digested animal excrement and go, you know, that will work for Insert problem here. Once again, I put the question, how the heck did we survive? But nevertheless, we are here once again to bring to you yet another animal poop cure-all. And this time it was for contraception. Yes, in ancient Egypt, women would use crocodile dung as a contraceptive. Yay! Now, crocodiles were worshipped and sacred to the ancient Egyptians, so that could be one reason why they thought it would help. They would mix it with sour milk, sour milk, <sighs> to make it a pasty kind of poop dough with a hope that would create an acidic barrier to sperm. Kind of like a dungy version of a diaphragm or a cap used today, but covered in spermicide. We had to start somewhere, but I honestly can't think of a better way to kill the mood. Hold on, honey. Gotta shove some poop up there. Number four, sulfur for freckles. Ooh, this next one gets me hot. This next one is, hits too close to home. Sorry, frecklers. I love my freckles. Every summer they pop harder and harder, better, faster, and stronger. I love them. But back in the day, there were some pretty insane methods to get rid of them. I know, get rid of them. How could you, right? How dare you? Having freckles in ancient Roman days meant you couldn't participate in your favorite magical rituals. <laughs> Yeah, sorry Balthazar, I'll catch the next meeting, I guess. I'm gonna go wash up. Having freckles meant you were impure or polluted. And in ancient Greece, having a beauty mark or a thousand on your face or cheek meant a bright future was in store for you. So, depends really where I am, but kinda, I'm like, huh? Medieval Europe, moles or freckles meant that you were for sure a witch. Great. That one, they're kinda, they're, they're onto something a little bit. I got witchy vibes. Ancient China, if you had a red or black mole, that was actually a good sign, but a brown mole, like this one, meant grave warning signs. E. So depending where and when you were, that freckle that you named when you were seven could have possibly changed your entire life. In places where freckles weren't desirable, sulfur was used daily to get rid of them. We don't recommend lathering your face with sulfur. In fact, I think magical rituals are safer. Number three, Versailles and other palaces. Did anyone else imagine when they were a kid that they were born in the wrong era and should have been like prouncing around in golden embroidered gowns and palaces or being in a masquerade decked in velvet across the room from your secret lover? <sighs> Some more than most. Except there is a lot missing from that fantasy, specifically the smell. You'd think a place like Versailles with like halls of mirrors and lots of gold everywhere would be like the cleanest place to live in the 18th century, but the reality was stomach churning. Remember that red velvet dress? Well, that hadn't been washed in God knows how long and you were stuffed in a room with people wearing the same thing and everywhere was a toilet. That's right, nobles didn't wait to empty themselves in a chamber pot or bathroom of some kind. Versailles was their toilet. They would relieve themselves in empty fire pits, imagine if it was occupied, in the stairwell, behind doors, wherever they felt. Sounds too ridiculous to be true? <laughs> well, take this 1675 report of the Louvre Palace in Paris and I quote, on the grand staircases, behind the doors, and almost everywhere one sees, there are a mass of excrement, one smells a thousand unbearable stenches caused by calls of nature, which everyone goes to do there every day." Unquote. Things got so bad in other palaces, Henry VIII even had to decree that cooks in the royal kitchen were forbidden to work naked. Why were they working naked? I don't know. Or in garments of such vileness as they do. So as for my first point, I think I was born in precisely the right era. Number two, finger food. You ever go to somebody's house for dinner and they have like 15 forks laying in front of you, just way too many utensils for no reason. That's why I like nachos, okay? It's not intimidating. Burgers aren't intimidating. You can just eat with your hands and get messy. It's easier. It's way more fun as well, just to dive in and make an absolute mess. Like medieval times, for example, they had cutlery, but you had to be somebody fancy to have it. Most of the population, being poor and all, had to eat with their hands. Chopsticks were first used during the Shang Dynasty, the oldest chopsticks ever found went as far back as 3000 BC. But come 400 AD, China's population spiked, resulting in a lack of resources for food. These stirring sticks now got a lot smaller to fit for their smaller portions, and that was the start of chopsticks. Fun fact. Come the 1600s, 
16th century, the rich and fancy carried their own set of forks with them to their royal dinner. King Charles V of France had a vault, a vault with a few forks in it. He's like, hey, check this one out. Bing. That's how rare that kind of metal work was back in medieval times. I bring plastic forks to work. Does that count for something? I have like two in my backpack, maybe three. Number one, and last but not least, a gong farmer. Adding to that fantasy I spoke about earlier, living in a castle with a glistening, sparkling moat. What moat could you want? Well, I'm sorry to say that moats often doubled as toilets. Very often when castles were built, the toilets would be built high up in the castle hanging over the moat so that it would just drop right in there. But another way they would deal with their droppings was to build a toiletry over a cesspit, kind of like an outhouse, or kind of exactly like an outhouse. Except at one point, the cesspit would fill up, enter the hero of the hour. Today, we have people with machines who do it, Somebody actually had to go in there and do it himself with their bare hands. Friends, remove your hats in honor of the gong farmer. Their job was to get on in there, shovel it out by hand, and ferry it to a spot where they could bury it. It was a dangerous job for a multitude of reasons. The top ones including the pits were often riddled with disease, and they were often quite deep. So as a result, they were paid very well for the time to sweeten the fact that no one would go near them, so they would be forever alone. But even then, lives were lost. One man by the name of Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. What a way to go. Number 10, spinning. Two words, chewing tobacco. I am not the only one I know it who made this face while watching western movies and some grimy guy just like spits into a bucket like poo, some like browny green slime. In saloons in the old wild west, spitting became so common that it had to be outlawed at one point. Men would spit tobacco onto the floor with spittoons and cupsidors lined the bar. Most of the time, they missed. The job of cleaning them often fell to junior shop assistants, which was a worse job than cleaning a fast food chain bathroom. They essentially became little cesspools of disease, and people got really worried eventually, because no duh, they're spitting all their stuff everywhere. Following the devastating flu epidemic of 1918, plus the constant fear of TB, anti-spitting campaigns were undertaken and it was outlawed. Number nine, shine bright like a diamond. If somebody told you that your face was glowing back in the late 30s, that would be the highest of all compliments. You'd be like, oh my god, thank you. I am not a vampire, but thank you. Thoradia was a beauty product company that made radioactive creams, radioactive powders, radioactive lipsticks, anything to get your glam on, all for the price of radioactive products. It didn't end well. This is insane to me. They took pride in using thorium and radium lead to tone facial tissues and remove wrinkles and all that jazz. And the product was doing so well that it circulated in Italy, Portugal, Romania, Egypt, Belgium, and France. Worldwide. It wasn't until 1937 until the French government caught on to these little pesky side effects, some would call. So the radium would literally make your skin glow a bit. That was the pull. That was like the, no way, really? Debit. And alongside the glow, also, you were having insane side effects that would ruin the rest of your life. Maybe that's Paul Rudd's secret. If his jaw starts to fall off, we'll know something's up perhaps. Number eight, the humors. Nope, this is not a joke. Ha ha ha, though it sounds like it. Ever heard the phrase to be in good humor? Well, it goes back to this. I mean, probably, I actually don't know, but it sounds like the two are connected. The four humors were the basis of medical treatment in medieval times. The idea was introduced by Hippocrates all the way back in ancient Greece, which combined ancient science, naturalistic knowledge, and philosophy. The four humors were blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. They were organized to represent the four elements, the four qualities of cold, hot, moist, and dry, as well as the four seasons and planets. If something was wrong with you, then it was because one of the humors was out of whack. If you were depressed, something was wrong with your black bile, for instance. Do I know what black bile is? No, I don't want to ever know. Are you too hot? Well, bloodletting will be the solution for that. The factors controlling your humoral makeup involved sex, age, temperament, and many more. Bloodletting was the most popular way of balancing the humors, and it was assumed to have a relationship with most diseases, from smallpox to pseudoscientific hysteria. What, you horny? Let's bloodlet ya. Number seven, public bathhouse. Okay, this next one, we haven't really moved on that much. We still bathe together, we still do it in like water parks, we swim in pools of pee pee, and then go down slides and burn our back skin off. Ancient Roman, so great, you're like, why did you have to ruin it? Ancient Roman bathhouses were the older, yuckier versions of these water parks. They also didn't have slides, so 
boo. They would literally spread intestinal parasites in these houses, pools, in these massive rooms with massive pools. The Romans were figuring out sewage systems at the same time, which I'll talk more about later, gladly, but they were also the first to create heated public baths. My above ground pool wasn't even heated, but the ancient Romans were. Now I'm upset. I'm gonna call my dad after this. The archeology span and anthropology department at Cambridge discovered that Romans brought lots of parasites to Europe. Fossilized feces show that these heated, relaxing, rejuvenating bathhouses nearby were all but. I don't mean to undermine the ancient Romans though, it's not what I'm doing, okay? To be fair, they also brought lice and fleas. Number six, no hand washing. I don't know. Believe it or not, washing your hands as a doctor before doing anything was a controversial idea. Today, especially due to the last two years, we all have a tune we sing while washing our hands to ensure we're laughing for like full 20 seconds. We've all done it. But when doctors discovered it was their fault people were getting sick, they didn't rejoice, they got offended. The whole conversation started because of a man called Ignaz Semmelweis. He was studying the differences between two birthing hospitals, one run by midwives, the other by doctors and students. The the mortality rate at the latter was way higher than the other. They were dying from something known as childbed fever, more closely known as sepsis. After a series of trial and error, he hypothesized that it was because the students were touching cadavers and then touching the mothers. He then made them clean every tool in their hands with chlorine solution, literally the best thing to kill germs, though he didn't know that at the time, he just assumed it would work. Well, wouldn't you know mortality rates improved significantly, but when he tried to enforce his findings, doctors were upset they were being blamed for the the deaths. He ended up getting fired over it and eventually thrown into a mental asylum near the end of his life. <sighs> Considering what we know now, that's rough. Number five dark dental days. Dental health is important. We have the charcoal toothpaste trend that I myself even hopped onto recently, but why are we even doing it? Do we know, other than it's on TikTok? Well, it helps remove stains, but aside from that, there's no hard evidence that this is the next best brushing method. We do it because it's popular. It feels like we're missing out on something. Well, Queen Elizabeth I apparently had a pretty strong desire for a Mars bar too, but back in the day, they didn't have TikTok. Brushing wasn't cool, nor was it perfected in any sense. The queen's teeth became riddled with cavities. Her teeth straight up began to rot and subsequently turn black. But seeing as she's the literal queen, people wanted to be just like her in any way. She started a short lived trend where women blacken their teeth on purpose just so they would appear rich enough to afford sugar. That's wild. That's like me walking around in a neck brace being like, oh yeah, I crashed my Lamborghini. I totally have one of those. Number four, arsenic. I think they were confusing this chemical with Accutane, which is a chemical we use today to treat acne. But for a while, arsenic wafers were used. Yes. The poison, arsenic, the thing that would kill you. Yeah, that one. In the 19th century, arsenic was marketed as a safe way, safe way, to effectively clear your skin. It also claimed to restore a youthful complexion that we as humans always long for. Now, it did create a very pallid complexion, but not because it was restoring the gift of life, but because it was killing off the consumer's blood cells. Yay! It also cleared acne pretty well, but it also created a dependency on the product. If the user discontinued using the wafers, then the acne would return even worse this time. Therefore, it would create a vicious cycle of slowly poisoning oneself to death because you'd have to go back on it so you'd look hot. I don't know. Number three, the trico system. Instead of plucking your eyebrows before prom or getting waxed head to toe like we commonly do so today, back in the 1920s, you needed the trico system to remove any unwanted hair. This device was booming in the 20s. Hair salons just had to have this machine. And I'll call it machine. It was changing the game. By 1925, there were over 75 systems installed in beauty shops. And what you would do is you would sit at this large desk, face a tiny small window, and for a few minutes, you would just be beautiful. Just 20 simple treatments of this radiation beaming off your face, and then bam, you're beautiful. What's, what's the trick, you ask? Radiation, they didn't know this yet, it was dangerous. They didn't know much at the time, but this thing was chock full of radiation. They used x-ray technology on their bare faces. That's like when you go to the dentist and they click the thing and then they run into another room. This one, they're like, just right there. No sheet, no metal, heavy thing, just face to face, now I'm hot. So in 1929, trico problems were on the rise. Ulcers, carcinoma, keratosis, death, just everything bad. This was not the solution you wanted, but you know what, at least you were hot. Sorry, gents, this isn't for you. Number two, moss. Okay, I'm not the only one who has asked this question in their minds. Periods. How in the heck did we deal with them without pads, tampons, diva cups, and my doll? I don't know. How? Well, <laughs> it doesn't look good, folks. It took a lot of trial and error to get us where we are now. The first disposable pads only came onto the market in 1888. Like, 
Well, what? Even earlier prototypes of menstrual cups were made out of aluminum or hard rubber. But you may be surprised to learn that moss was a common resource. Yeah, the thing you see on rocks and trees. Cloth and cotton weren't enough, so they resorted to using moss to help absorb ant flow when she came by. It could have been grabbed from anywhere. Although we know that moss isn't the most hygienic of materials, as it could be grabbed from anywhere, as I just previously stated, a rock, a tree, who knows? Physicians believed it had antiseptic properties. They even used it on the battlefield to stem the flow of blood. Menstruation at the time was considered a sign of witchcraft, even though it happened every month. Poisonous and dangerous at the time. Okay, I know desperate times call for desperate measures, but like, they reused it. They didn't throw it out after. Ugh. Ugh. And finally, number one. Roman toilets. When I go to the washroom, number two, whatever, that's my time. I'll straight up hold it for like three business days until I get home. It's called a bowel movement for a reason. It's a movement, it's an event. I need isolation, quietness. These poor Romans, I mean, thank you for inventing the toilet and all, that's really great and dandy, but I feel very bad for the first group of individuals that had to use these stone benches. The early OG toilets. God, that looks so cold. Also, I guess stalls, like walls, they weren't invented until much later. Couldn't have thrown up some Bristol board, Euphelius? I don't wanna be shoulder to shoulder with a guy who accidentally gulped uh, some public spa water hours prior. And don't even worry about wiping also because that wasn't invented until much later. You just do the old scrape, do the old stone cold scrape off the bench and then call it a day. Give this video a Roman thumbs down if you're glad for toilets. That means thumbs up. Number 10, let's start out setting the scene. So rather than rank the least to worst aspects of this year, let's set the scene of how this became the worst year. Prior to 536, the early 500s were in some pretty heavy transitions. The Western Roman Empire had fallen to German invaders, and the Eastern sect would soon follow suit. The Middle East was divided between the Byzantine and the Persian empires. China's influence continued to spread through East Asia, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam, even though it was experiencing a weak point. China was divided into both North and South territories and they were constantly at odds with each other. Africa, however, was developing trade routes through the Sahara and a powerful new kingdom was arising in Ethiopia. They wouldn't be heavily affected by this, but a part of them would be. Peasants throughout Europe were used to the tradition of harvest seasons being reliable until one day all this movement and all this growth stopped. Number nine, the mist. A mysterious mist rolled in over Europe, clouding the sky in darkness. With the mist, a century of darkness would fall. Literally sounds like the setting of a Stephen King novel. Byzantian historian Procopius wrote about a portent that took place that year and said this, and I quote, for the sun gave forth its light without brightness, like the moon during this whole year, and it seemed exceedingly like the sun in eclipse. For the beams it shed were not clear, nor such as it accustomed to shed. And from the time when this thing happened, men were free neither from war, nor pestilence, nor any other thing leading to death. The sun was eclipsed for 18 months. For three hours in the morning it would give light, but a light that resembled neither day nor night." Unquote. Other sources describe a cloud or dust veil that darkened the sky. Now, why did this happen? Here we are at number eight, eruption. Now, what on earth could have caused such a mysterious cloud of depression to seize the land? Well, after centuries of mystery, scientists have finally discovered what happened. It was a massive volcanic eruption that took place in Iceland. A professor of medieval history at Harvard University, Michael McCormick, led a study of a Swiss glacier which led to the discovery. Evidence of volcanic matter in the glacier proved that it was indeed a massive eruption that caused it. The ash from the eruption likely led to a fog that caused an 18 month period of darkness. It was so vast it spread across all of Europe, the Middle East and portions of Asia. Number 7, Climate Impact. This period of ominous and unexplained darkness led to serious negative transformations. A Roman politician by the name of Cassiodorus wrote that the sun looks bluish and that the moon had no luster. The seasons also seem to be jumbled together into one. No summer, no spring, just a long, ever gloomy middle winter kind of thing. Another eerie fact he added was, and I quote, we marvel to see no shadows of our bodies at noon, unquote. The dark sunless days brought periods of cold, with temperatures falling as low as 1.5 to 2.5 degrees Celsius all year round, making it the coldest decade in the past 2300 years. This is the closest the world got to the winter depicted in Game of Thrones, besides the actual ice age of course. This was called the mini and 
Antique Ice Age. Number six, starvation. But with the extreme cold, lack of sunlight, and seasons, crop failure destroyed many lives. Farmers no longer could look forward to a bountiful harvest in the fall as basically nothing survived. The Irish Chronicles show that they had a failure of bread, bread of all things, from the years 536 to 539. Europe, parts of Asia, and the Middle East experienced a massive famine crisis. When did things get back to normal? Well, it took over a century for things to really start to turn back. Eventually, grit fell from the sky and slightly warmer temperatures returned, allowing for some crops to return. But the people had no way of knowing when that was going to happen. They just had to keep slugging along every day, watching their friends and families slowly die of starvation. Not a good time to be alive. Number five, <laughs> the plague of Justinian. But things weren't about to get any better anytime soon. It wasn't just crop failure and famine they had to worry about. Soon, the bubonic plague was upon them. A couple years later, in 541, the bubonic plague swept across Europe, adding more woe to misery. It became known as the Plague of Justinian as it swept through the Roman port of Pelusium, Egypt, causing the deaths of half the Eastern Roman Empire's population. This, in turn, according to once again Michael McCormick, sped up the final demise of the once great empire. The plague struck Asia, North Africa, Arabia, and Europe, taking the lives of a colossal 30 to 50 million people. And now there weren't that many people back then, so this would have really, really made a dent. The same disease would return centuries later and would be known as the Black Death. The reason it was called the Plague of Justinian this time around was due to the poor response from the Byzantine ruler. He was unable to complete the projects he had started due to the farmers and workers dying by the thousands, so he decided to raise taxes and change the tax code. He not only demanded taxes from the people still alive, but demanded they pay the ones owed by their fallen neighbors as well. So not a good time. Number four, some benefits. There were some. Now, those scientists like to say this is the worst time to be alive in history. It depends where you were and it depends where you live. I mean, I keep thinking that maybe World War II was probably worse or World War I, I just don't know. But it was just such a long extended period of time. If you lived in the Arabian Peninsula, however, you may have actually been kind of grateful for it, you know? Due to the catastrophe, their weather changed for the good. They actually experienced more rainfall. This helped their crop and vegetation thrive. They had so much left over, they could give more to their camels. As a result, they were able to build larger camel herds to help facilitate transport for Arab armies aiding in conquest during that century. It also may have influenced agricultural development in Estonia with their production of rye. In Finland, hunting and fishing were their main sources of livelihood, so the lack of land production didn't really bother them. They were like, okay, cool, I've got this uh, reindeer. Number three, snow in China. China, on the other hand, was freaking the heck out. It snowed in the summer. In the summer! I cannot imagine like a more depressing thing to happen, okay? I like I really can't. I mean, I remember one time in May, it snowed after like two weeks of just like beautiful weather and it snowed again after the longest winter. It was the most depressing moment of my life. Anyways, in some parts of China, the weather was so bad that 70 to 80 percent of the population starved to death. So on top of the famine, it was the weather and all this stuff. Despite this event though, South China seemingly remained peaceful and prosperous under the Liang Dynasty, which lasted from 502 to 49. However, economic pressures and internal strife within the Northern Wei Empire continued to cause trouble. The Northern Zhao was finally defeated in 581 and the South asserted control over the North. This led to the final linking of North and South China when Emperor Wen began construction of a canal system connecting the two parts of China together. Number two, economic downturn. So obviously with the fact that agricultural production was way, way down, workers were dying left, right, and center, an economic downturn soon followed the wave of plague and the mist. As previously mentioned, rulers such as Justinian raised taxes like crazy, burying his empire in debt. But just how bad did it get? Well, the study of seeds found in excavations tell a pretty bleak story. They found a high number of grape seeds in the ancient trash mound. So what does that matter? Well, by going through each seed individually, that's dedication. They noticed a steep rise in the amount they found and then all of a sudden a steep decline of grape pips. The Byzantine Empire, for instance, was pretty well known for the sweet wine that they sold and they had connections with other like parts of Europe that they sold it to, which means the steep decline in the seeds indicates that their economic ties took a huge hit. And 
then last but not least, let's let's tie this whole thing together with survival. So how in the heck did we survive this thing? It was one foul hit after another. Bad weather, famine, plague, economic downturn, war, people being the worst. Well, a lot of it just had to play out on its own. The plague eventually died down, the planet started to slowly warm up, and along with those changes, the economy started to recover, though it would take over a century for it to actually be effective again. In the mid 7th century, Europeans began melting silver from lead ore, which led to the merchant class for the first time. This was a huge step. The Byzantines dedicated themselves to the preservation of history, and even though Justinian was the worst financially at the time, the critical reform he made regarding the legal system and those pesky construction projects set them on the right path for the future. Number 10, the bullet mouse trap. You might have heard me say that and say, what? Which is exactly what I said when I saw a mousetrap. That's main killing potential was to fire a lead slug Minuteman style at a small rodent. It is no exaggeration to say that the difference between this mousetrap and a musket is that a musket weighs a little bit more. The mousetrap was loaded just like a traditional musket of the time, with black powder, a lead ball, and even a percussion cap. In all honesty, I'm not sure how you go about defending this mousetrap. Textbook definition of overkill. Also, you know, there's a loaded firearm in the house with a hair trigger that a small rodent could set off by gently grazing it. I like to imagine a fun family game of, do I no longer have a sister or was that just a mouse, after hearing a small musket fire inside the home. I also had to mention that while the immediate danger of a 32 caliber lead ball finding a new home in your stomach is frightening enough, black powder being black powder is very volatile and produces a lot of energy. Fire hazard. Smokey the fire safety dog does not approve. Number 9. T for men. Winding the clock back to the 1800s, you'll find pictures of distinguished ladies and gentlemen. And these distinguished gentlemen have the fullest and thickest mustaches ever grown by man. Much care is needed to maintain such a manly image. So when an established gentleman goes for his morning tea, it would be rather unfortunate to get his mustache wet and ruin his dashing good looks. An invention of the 1800s beckons to solve this issue with the mustache cup. Mustache cups were invented so the chivalrous men of the day didn't ruin their grooming rituals with a cup of Earl Grey tea. The cups had a small porcelain mouthpiece with a smaller hole for drinking, while the main piece would protect the stash. It may sound ridiculous, but it almost looks like a modern travel mug. So maybe they were onto something. Number 8. Nightmare Story I don't know about you guys, but no matter how you present them, dolls are just creepy. Have you ever noticed that when someone has a creepy doll, it's never just one? There's always a bunch of them for some reason. I, I don't know, I wouldn't want the room to feel safe or welcoming after all. <laughs> one man in 1871 said, I know, let's make them even creepier by having them move themselves. The creeping doll, as it was called, was a doll-like automaton that had clock-like gears to simulate real human movement with the addition of hidden wheels underneath to aid in the doll moving across the floor. Because, you know, the last thing I need is this doll creeping into my bed at night. Whew. Number 7. Gee, this cane is heavy. As people began to settle down after imperial monarchies went the way of the dodo bird, it was a good idea in everyone's best interest to limit people carrying weapons. If people didn't have swords, it could make another revolution a little less bloody. But what's that I hear from upper class wealthy people who don't want to listen to the rules that they make? Well, how about concealed and hidden swords? Yep, that's right. Cane swords were a popular fashion accessory in the 19th century. As carrying swords fell out of fashion, royal men needed to take swords with them for self-defense, or so they thought. Even women were concealing these hidden bladed inventions and parasols. However, it was socially unacceptable for a woman to have such possessions, let alone have the ability to know such training. As time went on, the hidden compartments that held blades were replaced with my personal favorite item, a flask. Number 6. Look at all these cool chickens. Let's face it, we all went through our awkward phases in life. And if you didn't live through the early 2000s as a youth, then bands like Linkin Park and My Chemical Romance just don't hit as hard. So when trying to find the weirdest inventions of the 1800s, I felt like closing my bedroom door and playing Green Day as I dye my hair because I'm super serious about how I feel. Why do I feel this teenage angst, you ask? Well, that's because there's rose tinted glasses for chickens. Yeah, and they're cooler than me. Oh, Yeah, little tiny eyeglasses for chickens, but they actually have a good use. They were designed to prevent pecking and cannibalizing other chickens. Ooh. The theory goes that if a chicken was wearing rose tinted glasses, he couldn't distinguish between blood and what wasn't. That way they wouldn't attack each other. Yet another heartwarming comfort from the 1800s. Number 5. 
I'm coming out of this hole, partner. We enjoy many luxuries in the 21st century. Warm houses, everyday appliances, and the freedom to shout profanities at strangers on the internet you slightly disagree with, but you give them the business anyway because it's been a bad week and you deserve it. But probably what we should all be thankful for is modern medicine. Back in the 1800s, it just wasn't where it is today. A great example of that is safety coffins. A truly grim situation. A medical doctor has declared you dead. Now you are being buried alive. Have no fear friends, because you had enough money for a safety coffin. The coffin contained a device or means of various designs which was to alert the living of your mistaken burial and hopeful resurrection. The very rational fear of being buried alive most likely was spun from fiction and news at the time with the occasional case happening here and there. However, I'm of the opinion it should be a never ever kind of thing. Yeah, no thanks. Number 4. Your bad hair day has just been terminated. Oh to live in a time of industrial revolution where machines go and go. I'm sure that all this heavy industry won't enable bad practices of corporations and usher in the destruction of our environment. Pfft. No sir! This is the age of machines and if machines can help with one thing it most certainly can aid in another. May I introduce you the rotary hairbrush. Why brush your own hair when an overcomplicated machine can do it for you. At the time it kind of made sense. Machines felt like they were the way of the future. They were kind of right, but at this rate everything in the home would have intricate pulleys or a steam engine attached. Steampunk anyone? Number 3. Full of air. The industrial revolution changed the world, we can't deny that. That can also be said for the steam trains. But what about pneumatic power trains? Back in the 1800s a man named Alfred Eli Beach came up with such a design. Prior testing had proven useful enough to build a larger demonstration in New York. So he built a tunnel to test his air power train. It only ran a short distance, but the train held 22 people and was controlled by a roots blower nicknamed the western tornado. That was also my nickname in high school. Sadly the project didn't receive much support from the government at the time and other methods for trains eventually took over. Unfortunate because it sounds like Alfred Eli Beach was very dedicated to the project as he put up a very large sum of money to the project. The tunnel that houses his short train. The tunnel that housed the short train line was completed in 58 days. While he did have bigger plans for his train, it kind of just became an amusement for people. It was shortly shut down thereafter. But 58 days, that's pretty quick. I'd like to see that happen in a major city now. No way it's happening. Number 2. Get on my mongoose, bro. Looking at the Motor Scout, you can see the beginnings of what could be a four wheeler. Personally, I think it looks like a mongoose from Halo, but Mon thinks I play too many games. Designed by FR Sims in the late 1890s, it was never really meant for off road terrain, instead, to support infantry on smooth roads. Sims, understanding the annoyance of trying to ride your motorized quad cycle while someone is firing at you, placed a Maxim machine gun on the quad to return fire. Which is strange, because usually these things require a team of soldiers to operate. He also added an iron shield for a little extra protection. It is too bad that the next major conflict would have a lack of usable roads and more trenches than anything else. While it never did see combat, it was somewhat useful and would later inspire Sims to design the first armored car. Number 1. Bro, trust me. Everyone has a favorite article of clothing. For sports fans out there, it could be a lucky jersey, but back in the 1800s, there was an article of clothing no British soldier could be without the cholera belt. What does a cholera belt do exactly? Well, it helps to prevent cholera. I've got good sources bro, trust me. The running not so scientific theory at the time was that any abdominal issues and sickness was caused by a chilly belly. So simply make your tummy warm and voila, cholera has been prevented. British soldiers in India were often given the belts unaware of the biohazard that was an epidemic. The belts were just flannel that basically wrapped around you. It's a good thing we're not superstitious today and would never buy into such ridiculousness. Hey man, did uh, my order of healing crystals come in? I'm getting some bad voodoo vibes at home lately, man. I totally need just to cleanse that space, bro. At number 10, the king of hobbies. Everyone has their interests, right? Like, for example, I like video games, and I like watching people scream at their teammates for not helping everyone else out. I'm looking at you, Blake. For kings, back in the day, they didn't have people on Rocket League to scream at, so they had to find other interests. For Tsar Peter the Great, he had a lot of interests, and they were all very bizarre. Firstly, he had an obsession with short people, especially dwarves. To him, they were like his real life dolls or something, and he would 
would hold weddings for them and even hold lavish funerals, complete with small horses pulling a small coffin on a carriage and even a very short priest to hold the ceremony. But other than this obsession with short people, he also dabbled a bit in medicine. He liked watching surgeries be performed like he was trying to be on Grey's Anatomy or something, but when watching the surgeries just wasn't enough for him, he would sometimes perform them himself. Now remember, He's not a doctor, so it's no surprise to learn that these surgeries rarely ever went well and people died. I certainly wouldn't trust him to give me any kind of surgery, but he was a king so he could do whatever he wanted. Peter the Great also loved dentistry. It is said that if you wanted to get all buddy buddy with the king, all you had to do was let him pull your tooth. Sounds like the guy was one heartbreak away from starting his own medical drama, but in the worst way. Number 9. Banning Coffee This is the worst of the worst, people. Murad the Fourth, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. The guy banned coffee. Coffee, like an absolute monster. No more triple triples for you. He was born in 1612 and for the most part his mother was ruling through him because he was so young. That's often the case with most of these young rulers. They just get, hey you're seven, now you rule a kingdom, enjoy. It's, you know, it's tough, they're not going to know what's going on. But when he got a little bit older he put forth these laws, punishable by death, might I add, in order to get things back on track. That was the key. He banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian during the nighttime and would wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather, Murad IV himself would take your head off right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All because you're drinking a Bud Light Lime. And number eight, why are you mad? Now this could be a bit of a controversial opinion, but if your name includes the words the mad, I would assume that you're not doing too great, right? I mean, you have to earn that title, and if it's a title that harsh, that simply begs the question, what in the H-E double hockey sticks did you do to get that name? Well, for Charles the Mad, he did a lot. Charles became king when he was only 11 years old, so that certainly didn't help his development and knowing this kind of helps explain a lot of his actions. He was known for getting really angry and throwing fits of rage and was known to give people the gift of the big sleep, if you know what I mean. Charles didn't always kill people though, only sometimes. Other times he liked to switch things up. Sometimes he would run around his palace pretending to be a wolf. Other times he would go through phases where he just really didn't want to keep up with his personal hygiene and he would get so gross that he literally had to be cut out of his own clothes. Now I don't know how long you have to go without bathing to get to that point, but really I don't think I want to know the answer to that question. Charles also thought that he was made of glass and so he would go through phases where he would sit completely still so that he didn't break. Kind of like Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy, but not as, you know, extraterrestrial. Well, maybe he was. That honestly would explain a lot. Number 7. Party Hard Zhu Huzhao was the emperor of the Ming Dynasty in the early 1500s. Now lately we've been talking about kings and queens, we're on part 2's for both now, and there's a good amount who simply just aren't ready, they're too young to rule. Like Joffrey from Game of Thrones, kings like that actually existed, they were horrible. They were young, they were too young to know what was right and wrong. Plus they usually have some corrupt parents whispering in their ears the entire time. Zhu took the throne at just age 14, and for a while ministers were confident that he would grow into the role and become the leader that he was born to be. Well, when he got older he transformed a zoo just outside of Beijing, he transformed it into his own personal brothel. Yum. I mean on one hand I'm glad the animals are free, but like a zoo? You couldn't find a more romantic place? Can convert an Applebee's to a brothel maybe? I don't know, something with AC? His final days were spent partying and some would say a little bit too hard. He got intoxicated and fell from a boat. That's how he ended his life. Honestly, not a bad way to go out. Pretty OG. At number 6, love game. A lot of kings and queens throughout history have been known to engage in the horizontal hustle a lot. I mean, when you're a ruler of a kingdom, you don't really have much to do in your spare time. So what else are you going to do? Play a board game? No. These monarchs were getting busy all the time, but there was one king who was just so obsessed with getting a good old pickle tickle that it just became his whole personality. King Philip V was known to be a nymphomaniac and he liked doing the deed a lot, but because at the time the Catholic Church said that having sexy time with anyone but your spouse was a sin, the king and his wife were getting busy all the time. Eventually his first wife caught on to how to use this to her advantage and she would often refuse to sleep with him until she got her way with anything she suggested or demanded from him. You would think that he would catch on to this game, but maybe his urges were just so strong because he always caved and gave her what he wanted. Obviously this man did not follow Hoodville. 
Absolutely not. Just to give you guys an idea of how obsessed this guy was, when his wife was on her deathbed, before she went eh, he literally tried to get one last bang in. On her deathbed. Like, dude, not the time. <laughs> Number five, George V. We love hobbies here on Bumblebee. I mean, I used to collect special quarters growing up. I swear to God, the only time I've ever been good at saving money was when I was 12. I would see one of these and be like, mm, don't touch it. George V turned out he loved stamps. A lot, like a lot, a lot. Since he was a wee young lad, he was collecting these little guys. Here's the unusually impressive part about him though and his hobby. He continued to collect stamps during World War I. This guy was busy, everybody's trying to stay alive and George is just licking stamps in the library like a prince. Like all collections, it started at an early age and now it's at the point where it's past impressive and it's just borderline strange. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages full of stamps. Quick maths, that's like 20,000 pages full of stamps. So naturally he was nicknamed the king of stamps, or rather the king of philately, the official term for collecting stamps. It's a nice word. Philately. Philately. Back in 1905, he set an all-time stamp record, which I didn't even know if that was the thing, and it was the most money ever spent on a single stamp. The guy dropped like 220,000 US on a single stamp. Somebody even asked the prince down the road if he had heard about this idiot who spent 1,400 pounds on a stamp, and he was proud of it. He was like, that was me, that was me, you wanna see it? The next King George is a little different, to say the least. At number four, Womanizer. I'm going to preface this by saying that George IV of England was voted as England's worst king by historians, so that should already tell you a lot about this guy. Georgie here was yet another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his intimate conquests, you know? Now we do know that the encounters that he was on were all consensual, so that's a plus. However, he was still creepy about it, yeah. This man tried everything to get a woman to sleep with him, he would throw a tantrum if she said no, or threaten to end his life if he didn't get to do the eight-legged nature dance, you know? Somehow, this had a pretty good success rate, even though he was not a catch at all. It feels like this was one of those situations where you kind of just give in to make him stop talking, you know? Anyways, this guy was super creepy, because on top of the lengths that he would go to just to get some time in the sack, he also kept trophies of his conquests. He would ask each of the people he slept with for a lock of their hair, and he kept them all. Back then, it was kind of common for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, but George's collection was alarming because of just how many locks of hair there were. After the king died, his brothers found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. Fun fact, if you want to see this insane collection, it is in a museum in Scotland, so check that out if you want, I guess. Number three, kleptomania part two. On our spoiled queens list, Brie mentioned Queen Mary and how she just couldn't stop stealing, which is hilarious to me, just this old lady stealing your Well, the last king of Egypt also had sticky fingers. He was even better at it too, check this out. Farouk I was the youngest son of Egypt's first king, Fouad I. Now born in 1920 in Alexandria and in his early days at school, he couldn't concentrate. The king sent him to England even after to hopefully find a better way of teaching, something that works for him, but still it was to no avail. Once the king passed away in 1936, Farouk then got the throne, but also so much property and so much money. He had hundreds of fancy cars, 75,000 acres of land. This guy had it all. Literally, he had anything he could think of, but still, he felt like he needed to take more, to steal. At 17 years old, he would slam 12 eggs for breakfast and then wash it down with 30 bottles of beer. Nutritious and delicious. Horrible. On top of the fact that he loved to steal, he was the biggest hoarder. So he had thousands of shirts, randomly. He also had 50 diamond studded walking sticks for some reason. And like a prince such as myself, he too collected coins. I mean, his collection was much nicer, but still, great minds think alike. Spoiled minds think alike, rather. Oh shit, this is eye-opening. One of the most bizarre facts about Farouk was he pickpocketed Winston Churchill once. He took the guy's watch. After everything I just said, he still decided to steal his watch. What a gem, we love him. We are At number two, the king of pettiness. Let's talk about a ruler that the Indian state of Alwar has described as controversial. If his own people are calling him controversial, then you know something's up. And boy, you better strap in because you're in for a wild ride with this one. Maharaja Jai Singh was pretty eccentric in a pretty dark way. He was known to have a temper and act on impulse, and he did some very questionable and downright 
scary things. He was known to be very competitive and hated to lose. One time while playing polo, he and his team lost and so in retaliation he blamed the horse he was using and made the horse get extra crispy. He uh, fired his horse. I'm sure you know where I'm going by that. If not, use your noodle, I don't know. Unfortunately, the cruelty towards living things didn't stop in animals and he was also known to kidnap women from the streets and go all criminal minds on them. On a slightly lighter note though, the Maharaja was also known to be very petty. Once he went into a Rolls Royce dealership and the person working there thought that he was broke and ignored him. Thinking that this was insanely rude, he bought seven Rolls Royces, sent them back to India and used them to pick up garbage. This guy was really just doing the absolute most. And coming in at our number one spot, King Ludwig II. Home renovation shows rock my world. I can watch Love It or List It for months at a time. It's the dream, building your own home one day. And if you're a king, well, it's pretty easy to get that done. In our Spoiled Queens part two, I mentioned a princess that had a house made of ice, literal ice. Well, King Ludwig II had numerous castles built to resemble fairy tales, literally like fairy tales. I gotta admit, I kind of love this a lot. Ludwig was only 18 when he became the king of Bavaria in 1864, and then he had castles, like castles, more than one, built after he was inspired from romantic literature and spending some time at the opera. The kid was a dreamer, you gotta love it. He would spend his nights in one castle looking through a telescope at his new castle being built, so he would just watch it all night. That's like the king's way of waiting for your Amazon delivery, just standing there just like, coming. 17 years and it's done. Just four years in, he designed his own castle and to this day, it's one of the most photographed places in the world. Neutrinstein Castle. Go check it out. It's literally a paradise. Yeah.